Yo, let's go. Let's get let's get our buddy on here. Here he comes. What's up, y'all? What's up? What's up? Hello. What up, bro? <laughs> Everybody, yo, we got a big special guest tonight. Our friend <laughs> David Patrick Harry from Church of the Eternal Logos. Finally on my channel over here. So everybody yes, give, him a, give him a give him a clap in the uh in the chat. And uh so good to have you over here. I've done I've been so um honored to be on your stream so many times doing all the great movie analysis that we've that we've done. So much fun. And tonight we're covering uh Master and Margarita. So uh, so good to have you here. And this is, you brought this up. This was your idea. You've covered it um, in yeah. a book club over at, at Church of the Eternal Logos. Um, and you've done so much in-depth uh, material. So I'm looking forward to getting into some literary analysis with you. Yeah, this is going to be a fun one. Um, I think for many people I've talked to, at least Americans, they haven't read this book. And it's a great, one of the great, although there's many Russian novels. Um, and there's so much in it. It's hard to really put your finger on really... Um, what is it about? Is it a criticism of the Soviet Union? Is it a promotion of magic? Is it a subtle theological criticism? Is it a love story? Or is it all these things? So yeah, yes, it's it's incredibly complex. Um, and I first read this back in. Um, here's the novel, guys. Bulgakov. Yeah, I, I have Mikhail this Bulgakov. copy. Awesome. So it's called The Master and Margarita, and I first read this in 2016, and. You know, I tore through it again this time. And this time, I mean, I really went in depth with it. And, you know, I know we're going to it's hard to know where to start with this, because yeah. like you said, you know, it's a sort of a meta meta narrative. There's a book within the book. Like you said, it's a love story. It's an allegory. It's surrealistic. It's funny. It's a comic novel. It's um, certainly a satire. It's a satire of uh, Soviet Russia. But it's also it's it still stands today. It's incredibly relevant um, and 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 revelatory, I think, in a number of ways. And one thing that I was really um, surprised to find this on this go around was that there have been a number of movies that have come out around the last time that I read it. And then since then, that take a lot of the imagery from this book, um, yeah. especially because it involves the selling of the soul and the the, the harrowing of hell. Um, also number of like carnival scenes um and we've covered i've covered a lot of these um in in themes in some of the other novels that i've covered so mm -hmm. i'm going to go through those as we go through it but what's your what's your um what's your overall take just before we begin especially for people like you said that haven't heard of the novel or haven't haven't um ever mm -hmm. uh, delved into it so I'm a big fan of this book. It's one of the reasons why I asked when you mentioned about doing a, a literary review. I was like, well, have you done the Master Margarita yet? You're like, no, man. We, no, man, we got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was excited because it is all over the place. Uh, as we'll talk, this, this book is flashing between 1946, the height of the Stalinist regime and the Soviet Union. Uh, specifically in Moscow, but then he's flipping back and forth between this narrative regarding Pontius Pilate and Jesus Christ. Um, and for really three fourths of the book, you're not entirely sure how these things are going to overlap till you get towards the end. And for a few of the themes that I wrote down that I think are central to the book is courage and cowardice. This is a huge theme in regards to Bulgakov is really highlighting the cowardice that is taking place amongst his fellow uh, Soviet uh, Soviet members and the lack of true creativity and authenticity. And that is the next one is art and authenticity. We're going to learn about the Mazalit Society, which is the sort of literary society that he's using in the book to highlight that these people, in exchange for not actually producing authentic art, which is truthful, real, and criticizing real uh centers of power they will say whatever the soviet union wants them to say whatever the powers that be and in exchange they get to become gluttonous and engage in these um you know delicious meals with the finest champagnes and wines uh but at the same time they don't really do anything and so this book i think is so revelatory to look at america in 2023 because there's so many themes that undergird this book that i think are very contemporaneous in addition to, and this is where uh, it's not exactly, I know some people said, oh, is it like an Orthodox Christian? Well, 
not exactly. Um, certainly, Bulgakov is highlighting that the lack of the belief in God is uh, prevalent within the Soviet Union. However, the enamoration or at least fascination with evil is also present. But again, they reject the reality of Jesus Christ. They reject God, generally speaking. So ambiguity of good and evil. One of the things that Bogakov does, which, you know, as a as somebody more versed in theology, I uh, don't know how to wrestle with, is that they sort of necessitate each other. And so Satan, again, and I don't know where, where to begin here because there's so much, but Satan obviously is visiting Moscow and he's creating all this chaos. But he's also an ambiguous figure because he also in, in ways brings justice due to people's true natures and revealing who they are. So the again, the main themes I have, cow, courage and cowardice, art and authenticity, ambiguity of good and evil, love and hope. Um, one of the things, again, the book is titled The Master and Margarita, and as we go through, we'll find out who exactly these characters are. But Bogakov is highlighting that authentic love is not just an emotion, but it's a force. And it's a force, a real force and a truthful force. And we'll find that the characters of The Master and Margarita, it's through love in which they're able to engage with evil, face Satan, face evil, and also not be scared of it. And then uh, the dangers of the absurdity of Soviet of, of Soviet society. So, with in regard to this whole book, again, Mikhail Bogakov, um, he wrote many works that were not allowed to be published at his time. And so, in a way, this is, in in a subtle way, he is the master in regards to this book because he actually wrote the Master of Margarita, which was not allowed to be published. And he had it memorized. And so one of the lines that we'll get to is that manuscripts never or manuscripts don't burn. Right. And um, and it's highlighting that he himself actually burnt the original manuscript to this book, but he had it memorized and he rewrote it later. And so um, how exactly can you criticize the Soviet Union? And so he's doing that and he's deconstructing the sort of uh, failures of what communism said it was going to bring, equality of social status, equality of economic rights. But he highlights in this book that actually it's not the case at all. And, and most people are totally self-centered and egotistical and just interested for what they can get out of it. Yeah, excellent. I think that one of the overriding themes when I reread the book is something you don't get to until the very climax of the book which is uh, a peace through grace there's a scene where you know, spoiler for people um and we haven't we haven't even gotten into what the what the uh, narrative <laughs> arc is here or what the plot of the book is because it's very complex it's incredibly <laughs> complex but at the climax of the book the master um is told or they basically woland this character woland who is satan um meets with matthew who tells him via Christ that he's earned peace, but not the light. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so I think that in terms of the writer or the writer within the book, the writer within the writer writing the book within the book. Um, and like you said, burning the book um, has earned this sense of peace through struggle. Um, uh, it, and the, some of the notes bring up, you know, uh, a Christian in conscience in terms of, uh, Pontius Pilate. Um, and what, what's interesting here is that the book within the book will mirror the, the general overall arc of both master and Margarita and the, and Margarita doesn't appear until like the second half of the book. She's not even in the book. Right. Um, and it's some of this, the strongest passages are when we first meet her. She's a very interesting character and um, her, pr the process of her becoming a witch in the book is real is so relevant now. Um, and again, like I said, there've been so many movies, like if you've seen the witch, everybody, you know, I've talked about this movie a bunch of times, um, 2015, the witch, this, she goes through the exact same process of, of apotheosis. That is, I mean, it must be verbatim from this book. It's the exact same. And also Eli, I did a stream on uh, post-apocalyptic literature and film and Eli in the book of Eli with Denzel Washington also does that. He not in the same way she does. I'm saying he memorizes the Bible. He memorizes the book and we have the burning of the book like we do in the ninth gate in um, Roman Polanski's the ninth gate, but the manuscript doesn't burn. 
And I think that it's interesting because like you said, I mean, the, the idea of duality and of temptation is so different in this book. It's like, you, you know, you, you mentioned this, that it's, it's almost that Woland and his retinue are uh, agents of divine justice in this sort of dualistic. I mean, the book is, it's, it's like Christian Gnostic. It's satanic at times. It's atheistic. But what really I think is, would be interesting to people watching is that, and that drew me in this time is that the book begins with this philosophical debate that we see that you, you know, that we see so many of our friends doing, right. Which right. is we have two people debating and then we have a, an outside character who comes in. And the, the, the thing that really it was, was marked this time. And I marked it in the book. I went down. It's total schizo rabbit hole this time was that I marked every single conversational and casual colloquial mention of devil, Satan, Faust, Mephistopheles, witch, evil, magic, anything that was on the sort of dark side. I, I, met, I marked every single one in the book. And you get to a point where there are thousands of them. There are so many. And Christ is mentioned by name one time in the book. Mm -hmm. However, the character of Jesus Christ is given a different name. And we have this sort of, we have people going by others. We have Pilate, but, but, mm -hmm. and we have Judas. And then we've got, you know, math, math, Matthew is sort of mentioned, but all of the, the devilish characters are mentioned sort of by otherness. And we have behemoth and we've yep. got Azazello who is Azazel. Yeah. But what do you make of that? I mean, what do you make of the fact that the, that Woland is given a, another, I mean, we know about satanic names, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, all the, all the various names, but that Christ is given the name um, Yeshua Al Nosri, I think. Yeah. I so what do you make of that? Why does he do that? Why does he choose to do that as a writer? Bulgakov? Well, and we'll we'll get to it. Uh, chapter two is where the the narrative totally moves from Patriarch Pond in Moscow to the scene where Jesus Christ is presented before Pontius Pilate, and this is used throughout the book to highlight cowardice because Pilate is wrecked with the fact that he eventually sends Christ to his death, and yet he knows deep down that he was innocent and that actually his message is more powerful than the Roman hierarchical authority that he's a part of. Um, and when you first read it, like I remember when I first read the book and hadn't got to the second half, I was thinking, cause it's Woland Satan, um, the foreigner who is telling this story and he's telling these two gentlemen, these two literati of again, the sort of, Moscow elite, part of this Mazalit society, um, that one of them is arguing the fact that Jesus Christ wasn't a literal historical figure and that he is a son of God like all these other gods. And Wolin, Satan, is walking by this park and hears them say this. And so then he sets down between them and is enamored by the fact that they don't believe Jesus was real and then begins to tell this narrative. And it's not the biblical narrative. And so throughout this book, um, even begging the question in regards to the, he refers to Matthew, the gospel, Matthew, the apostle as Matthew Levi. And there's a scene where he claims that Jesus said that Matthew is a devout disciple, but he gets everything wrong when he writes it down. And so you first read it and you think, oh, okay, well, this is Satan calling into question the reality of scripture and the gospels themselves. But, um, you know, Bogakov is pulling from like Faust is a huge influence in this book. Um, so many references yes. back to Faust. And so he's pulling on uh, Slavic mythology in regards to witches and folklore. He's pulling on biblical narratives and he's pulling on contemporary Soviet society. And I, I couldn't really put my finger on it because once you get into the second half, you realize that the person telling the stories regarding Pontius Pilate aren't in fact, aren't actually Woland. It's, it's the master or it's the narrator. Or it's the person who's actually writing the book. And it's as if he's trying to give you insight into aspects that the gospels don't talk about, but at the same time, they're so contradictory to scripture that one of them has to be real. The other one has to be real. So it's hard to tell. That's why I say when people ask if it's a, is, is this a Christian book? Is this an, 
not exactly, but at the same time, the whole theme is about a recognition of the supernatural and that God is real. And first, the recognition that the devil is real, and if evil is real, then the opposite must be true. And so it yeah. is very dualistic the way he frames it, which isn't actually you know Christian theology, typically speaking. Yeah, it's it's again, it's complex what he does at the beginning because, like you said, they are having this this debate, this sort of atheistic debate. And he uh, enjoys this because, because the book is partly a satire on the, the atheist state of the nation, how it's a, it's a playground for Satan. Yeah. And, but, but the point that he makes throughout the rest of the book is that no Christ is real. And these things did happen and happen. And I was there. Right. Um, and here's, so here's the sort of empirical evidence um, for this. And I think that, uh, one of the things that Bolkakov does by having these various names for, you know, having another name for Satan and then, and of Christ, of course, having um, Christ's name uh, the way it is, I think is that he's presenting these, let's, let's say characters because of the book um, as other, they're outsiders because there's like you mentioned the idea of foreigners, the idea of the, there's this sort of self-contained state with the big wall around it. That is Soviet Russia. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that, the idea of the foreigner or the outsider is is so potent uh, in the conversations that all these millions of very you know side characters have in the book that when they when we see Roland he's a he's an other he's from the outside and he is he's an outsider he's from hell right and and so but when he does that he's also presenting Christ as in this sort of everyday like the conversations. Um, you know, leading in the passion are like everyday conversations. They're, te they're testimonials, like in a court case. Yep. And so I, I suppose it's supposed to bring you in the thing that, that struck me the most in terms of like, uh, uh, an emotional personal impact in this book is the, the really short passage, um, during the, during the testimony, when they mentioned this guy, rat killer, uh, who is a centurion uh, rat killer is the, He's the centurion who leads Christ uh, up to Golgotha, and then he, you know, he's in charge of the execution. And this guy is presented as the biggest uh, brute, you know, yeah. in the in the Roman army. He's got battle scars from you know fighting in Germany. And there's this part where um, he asks, he's been torturing Christ, yeah, and he asks um, what he thinks of him, and he says. Um, it's it's uh, just to paraphrase he says i don't think he's very happy you know i don't think that he has any peace and i thought that was that that to me was was ve was really strong because it plays into the fact that you know th with thousands of of conversational um co you know colloquialisms of you know the devil the, they'll often say like the devil take me or the you know yeah. oh the hell with that you know Right. All of these mentions. Well, the name of Christ one time in the book is enough to destroy all of these thousands of other mentions of Satan or hell. Right. And so the one, the one time in the book where we have the guy who is torturing Christ and he says, I, you know, I hope he finds peace. I, I, he's praying for this, for this guy. Right. And, and the dichotomy I thought was, was really striking. It was very, it was a, it's a painful passage to read. Um, and then, of course, we, you know, I mean, there's so many characters. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We're going to have a trouble for keeping everybody with the names because they're all going to be Russian style names. Right. And uh, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of different people that are introduced to the story. But like you're pointing out, um, Roland, Roland, the Satan figure makes a point that like gets like. So you can think about the hermetic adage as above, so below. And whenever Christ is presented, what he's doing is not corresponding to what he's receiving. Mm -hmm. And this is and this is this general theme about, again, the ambiguity of good and evil is that, um, for example, the the Roman soldiers harassing him on their way to Golgotha and they offer him water, which, of course, we know that he is thirsty, according to the, the, the Gospels when the in this narrative um, he declines it for somebody else who's more thirsty. And so the, in another, in the second half of the book, we'll meet somebody once Satan has his, uh, 
his enormous ball there in Moscow is there's a woman who it, it, she's dead. Pres presumably she's in hell. She's brought to this ball and she's plagued by the handkerchief, which she used to suffocate her newborn baby because that yeah. baby was born due to rape. And so, again, she begot evil with evil, and therefore she's located in hell. And she's then, uh, Margarita forgives her at one point, and we see that she is then released. But again, it takes not begetting the thing in which you're receiving mm. to actually change something, to not continue the perpetuation of these sort of evil domino effects. So what do you mean? What do you mean? He's thirsty. Why wouldn't he take the water? This is dangerous. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. Yeah, the you've mentioned Faust a number of times, and Goethe's Faust is the epigraph to the book. Yeah, and in this one, the translation it says it says, um, and so are and so are you. After all, I am part of the power which forever wills evil and forever works good, and that's Goethe's uh, Faust. I did a an analysis of um, Marlowe's Doctor Faustus, which again is a completely different perspective on this because in this one, in that one, you know, um, Doctor Faustus. Sells his the story of Faust is that he want he sells his soul for wit you know for knowledge he wants to be right. the smartest guy in the world and then at the end of Marlowe's um, Doctor Faustus uh, Mephistopheles comes calling and he goes through this process of wishing that um, everything you know he wishes he could take take it back he wishes for a drop of Christ's blood to save him um, he wishes for uh, Pythagoras metempsychosis I, I wish I could just you know, transmigrate my soul into the soul of a cockroach, you know, just be anything else. And then he wishes for total ob obliteration. But then in the end, he's taken to hell. He knows he'll he'll have to face punishment. But in this one, it's it's again, like you said, it's it's so different. Yeah. Um, and the book begins. Should we should we we can go through. I mean, we can't go through chapter by chapter. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, a it's massive. It's a, book. it's a thick there's a, and there's so much that happens. We can do chunks of yeah. the narrative at a time. But um, so, yeah, go ahead. So it begins. Um, it says, never talk to strangers. First chapter. Yep. And it begins uh, one hot spring evening, just as the sun was going down, two men appeared at Patriarch's Ponds. One of them, 40 ish, wearing a gray summer suit with short, dark haired, bald on top, paunchy and held his proper fedora in his hand. Black horn rim glasses of supernatural proportions adorned his well-shaven face. The other one, a broad-shouldered, reddish-haired, shaggy young man with a checked cap cocked on the back of his head, was wearing a cowboy shirt, crumpled white trousers, and black sneakers. And then we meet these two guys, uh, Berlioz and the poet uh, Pony Roy, who wrote under the pen name Be Bezdemy, mm -hmm. right? And they start talking. They start having this uh, philosophical debate, like you mentioned. And just because we mentioned the two... Uh, those those characters at the beginning some of the do you want to go through first go through uh some of the major characters in the book and and discuss because you're you're um you know adapted this um and we've got especially in Wolin's uh, retinue so there's kind of an anti a reverse trinity that occurs in the book which is we have Woland who is satan right then we've got behemoth who right. is a which, which is a humanoid cat, right? So it's yeah. a, it's a big fat black cat that walks on two feet and can talk and drinks from glasses of water with a single paw. So yes, um, this is one of the right hand men of Wallen, along with uh, Korovyev, which is the um the, the man who can sort of be anywhere. He kind of vanishes. This begins the story. Then we have. Uh, as a Zello, which is the redheaded gentleman that you were just describing with the yellow fang, and he is representative of Azazel, an actual demon, uh, again, according to biblical tradition. And then you have Hela, which is a it's a seductive uh, succubus who's naked and uh, smells like sulfur. So she mm. sm she she smells like the undead. But um, when she she'll kiss people and engage with various figures in the book and turn them into uh, undead figures as well, i.e. vampires. And we've you know, we've actually covered Azazel, Azazel in the movie Fallen on right. your channel. We did an analysis of, of Fallen with uh, Denzel Washington, where this demon of the air appears and, and you know, and there's a, inhabits uh, various uh, various uh, for, you know, various people. And of course, people are aware of like some of these other people. They're not in the book, but like Pazuzu is the demon who's in um, The Exorcist. Um, 
Paimon is the demon who is in um, uh, the uh, Hereditary movie. Um, but here we have, here we've got Behemoth, who is usually uh, depicted like in the Blake, in the William Blake engravings as a hippopotamus. I think he's a, described as a hippopotamus. Um, well, yeah, I from I was looking at some of the, the notes in the back of this book, and it looks like the Russian word that we would use behemoth in English is me. It just translates as hippopotamus in Russian. Right. Yeah. And one of the things, <clears throat> one of the interesting things about this character, again, this humanoid cat, this big black cat is that <clears throat> he functions as both. So he's like a, witch's familiar spirit, mm -hmm. right? He's a sort of folkloric, bad, uh, bad omen, but he also functions as a kind of um, King Lear's fool. He can do things in the book that are, he's, he's mischievous, um, he, go, he goes through various like comical episodes and he's the only one in the book in, in terms of his retinue, um, that can do things without the direct order or approval of Satan. Mm -hmm. So he can, he can, he can even talk back to Satan, um, because he's sort of a, a King Lyrian fool. And then Azazel is the demon of the wilderness or the demon killer. And he functions as like an enforcer in the book. Um, mm -hmm. he, he chops, you know, there's, there are a bunch of decapitated head images in this book. Um, people are getting slaughtered. He's got the, he's got the ability that Jay was just talking about doing the other night and uh, the Benny Jesuit and how they have this ability to like start or stop a person's heart. And at one point Azazel does this, um, in the book. And so we've got this 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 weird sort of combination of people, and as is, I mean, they all have their episodes, which are extensive. Yeah, they're they are extensive in the book. Um, but then in terms of Christ's disciples, we just have Matthew. Matthew is the um, only one mentioned, and, right. and then Judas, the betrayer. Right. Um, and so right away on here on my second page, um, he says, or this is the fourth page. He says, for instance, the first times where they start doing this, this colloquial mention, he says, um, he says, uh, uh, Berlioz looked around miserably, not knowing what had frightened him. He turned pale, wiped his forehead with a handkerchief and thought, what's wrong with me? This has never happened before. My heart's playing tricks on me. I'm overtired. Maybe it's time to throw everything to the devil and go off to Kislevast. Um, and then. Uh, the next paragraph, a small head, uh, there was a man with a small head with a jockey cap, a skimpy little check jacket that was made out of air. The man was seven feet tall, uh, but very narrow in the shoulders, incredibly thin in his face. Please note, had a jeering look about it. And then a few paragraphs later, what the devil, exclaimed the editor. There, there are right. thousands of these references. Right. Um, and then we get into a discussion of, let's see, uh, Philo of Alexandria, Flavius Josephus. Book 15, chapter 44 of Tacitus's famous annals, whose mention is made of uh, uh, where mention is made of Jesus's execution is nothing but a later fraudulent interpretate interpolation. They say Berlioz then says there's not a single Eastern religion where an immaculate virgin does not, as a matter of course, bring forth a God into the world. And the Christians displaying no originality, whatever, uh, followed the same pattern where they created Jesus, who in fact never existed at all. That's where you have to put your main emphasis. And then here's where this sort of we really get going because they've just, you know, they've denied the existence of Christ even historically. Right. And so right. then we get into the discussion um, with who is it that appears as is L here. Oh, oh, okay. At the bottom of this page um, in this book, it says, um, it says um, to begin with, uh, another says that he was hugely tall, had platinum crowns and was lame in his left foot. We should add that all of the reports were worthless. To begin with, the subject was lame and neither foot, and he was neither short nor hugely tall, but simply tall. As for his teeth, the left ones had platinum crowns and the right gold. Um, he looked to be a little over 40, slightly crooked mouth, smooth shaven, dark brown hair, right eye black, left for some reason green, yeah. black eyebrows, but one was higher than the other. In a word, a foreigner. He's an outsider. Right. And the heterochromia is interesting because I think of David Bowie. It's like this, like, the movie just get day you know just get david bowie to play this role um and uh the other is that i forgot to and i i can't get through this without mentioning right now that i discovered this book because of the the rolling stones song sympathy for the devil mm. because the song is based on the book because he says in the in the song uh, i was there when pilot uh washed his hands and cleared his fate 
Um, and so that's so we have these characters like uh, that appear and say, no, Christ was real. And I was there when this happened. And here's what happens. Right. And it's interesting that that song was played. <laughs> that That is the song they were playing at Altamont. Uh, which was which is sort of seen as the end of the 60s it's 1970 it's after woodstock and it's where the hell's angels were the uh security right. for the altamont concert uh uh mick jagger is wearing black and red and has a devil uh painted on his chest and they're singing this song when the guy gets stabbed in the audience so it's a sort of ritual come true of the book leading into the song which i think is is crazy and when it describes uh, Wolin, Satan, they mention, and it's uh, that the head of his staff is the head of a poodle. And so we get the connection back with Faust because when Faust first encounters the devil, he encounters him as a poodle. And so we see these connections here. And so this chapter one, again, these two gentlemen, these two literati are uh, debating the existence of Jesus Christ. Satan hears this. He becomes quite interested, sits between them. And uh, one of them, Berlioz, uh, denies eventually the existence of the devil, which the devil, then I, again, irony, um, is right in front of him, uh, lets him know that he's going to be losing his head. And one of, mm -hmm. and what this it is sort of a metaphor throughout the book has to do with this belief in, in Soviet rationality. And that rationality is going to uh, take you to this sort of utopian place, whether it be equal economic and social rights. But um, and how they will explain away these uh, magical, mystical experiences with the devil. And so Berlioz, uh, again, due to the blindness of his rationality, denies the devil to the devil's face. And the devil then tells him, you're about to lose your head, basically from a, uh, a uh, train cart here in just a few uh, minutes. And, yeah. and he's like, what? And that's exactly what ends up happening. So... Um, Another thing that I think is interesting about Satan is, is he is the eternal foreigner. And so he doesn't mm. have a home and home and peace are something that plays throughout this book. And even then we see the character of Ivan, who is homeless. Uh, we see this connection and Ivan ends up being a character that doesn't fully learn from the experience. Um, and we'll find this in the very end chapter, chapter 32 in the epilogue is that He's still not sure, and he didn't learn from these encounters with the mystical, with evil, um, and he still kind of then falls into these official Soviet narratives that these there's a mass chaos that happens in Moscow over these two three day period. Well, it was a it, it was a form of hypnosis, and that people you know it was people going out of their minds due to somebody manipulating them, but it wasn't magic. It certainly wasn't the devil. Uh, there is no supernatural, and we have to then, again, explain away these things. And so him losing his head sets the sort of tone and tenor of the book that it's rationality that is actually blinding people to the existence of good and evil. Isn't this so relevant now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, the, the, the craziest, we don't have to mention them, but the craziest things can happen, at least in the, let's say, geopolitical sphere. And not only are they completely um, rationalized away because, oh, a certain website told me that didn't happen. Right. Right. So, you know, it was fact checked and there and there it goes. Right. And then, no, I don't even remember that at all. What are you talking about? Right. No, everything went on because, I mean, I literally have had people say this to me. I don't nothing changed. What are you talking about? Right. What 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 world are you living in? Right. So it's again, it's ironic, like you said, that that um the de the denial of satan is the one that brings this uh sort of into the purview of at least uh, you know us we as the reader and that it takes losing one's head um f literally and figuratively within the novel to sort of go into this there are later images of sort of an anti john there's a, like in the um in the big in the satan's ball that occurs at the end there's a sort of a jo anti john the baptist image that occurs yes. um and there's a, that's interesting because there's a whole procession of all of these people representing all the various forms of sin yeah uh, in, including like caligula's there <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and um that that reminded me of um there there are dante and elements in this that are strong you know but this is dante's inferno is different because 
it's a procession through hell. Um, and even Milton's Paradise Law, there, there are Miltonian references in this. But it's interesting how we get this monumental book of prose with so much con so much complex content in it. Right. And yet there's not much in it that touches on the immensity of what you get in Paradise Lost. Part of that is because it's verse and this is and this is prose. Right. But and also part of it is that the theme is that, like you said, um, you know, we have these characters presented in a in rational means where we're supposed to see them as sort of human beings. Even even Behemoth, who is a black cat, is is constantly described as human. He's a, he's a human character. Right. right. Um, even though he's physically a black cat and people still deny that this happened. It's interesting how many times he like changes his, his girth, right? Yeah. Sometimes he's as big as a man. And other times people are like, Oh, I saw a black cat running through the alleyway. And it's right. like, yeah, he had glasses. Or he even becomes a human time. with a cat like appearance. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They, and they, they do that when they um, it's, it's especially, I think uh, brilliant at the end of the novel, when they are flying through the air, right? And we see them in their truest form. Right. And then you find uh, out he's one of the greatest court jesters that was mm -hmm. that ever lived, right? And so right. turns out that these two right hand men of Wolin at the end, we realized one was a knight, the other one, Behemoth the cat, was actually a court jester, and they are doing penance uh with Wolin. But again, that's what right. my point is. This isn't exactly Christian theology, people. We're not here to educate you on theology because it doesn't really accord with that but the the meaning and the depth of this book is profound and you used right. a word to describe it yesterday you said it's a bit of a labyrinth and it really mm -hmm. is because there's so many perspectives to look at the narrative from and i think again the the most interesting one is, is bogakov himself writing this book and trying to almost bring a critical awareness to so many different things, religion, evil, the Soviet Union, love, the bureaucratic structure, rationality. Like again, even in this first chapter, when Satan is sitting in between these men on the park bench in Patriarch's Pond, um, he brings up the fact, the guy who's denying the existence of the literality of Jesus Christ, um, they reference how Kant made uh, arguments, rational arguments, logical arguments for God. And they and he said, oh, you know, forget Kant. But again, what was Kant's greatest work? The critique of pure reason. So Bogakov, mm -hmm. again, th this is so well thought out. And to think that he burnt this whole thing and had it memorized. And that's another point that he highlights with the master is that in Soviet in Soviet Russia, if you were a true artist, true, authentic art that was real. And, and represented something that was just transcendent would not be allowed to be published. And so writers would actually have to memorize their work to keep it. And so that's where the, again, as we said, the saying, the most famous saying, manuscripts don't burn. That's where that comes from, from two things. One, they had to memorize it. But two, if you create a real piece of art, and that's where Dostoevsky and Alexander Pushkin are, are referenced in this book. If you create a real piece of art, um, it can't die. And in fact, it's yeah. a piece of you that lives forward. And the reason why it does is because it's real and it's truthful. Yeah. He, um, the part with Kant for the folks at home, they mentioned Kant's proof. And he says later on, he says, I'm sorry, replied the stranger in a soft voice, but in order to be in control, you have to have a definite plan for at least a reasonable period of time. So how may I ask can man be in control if he can't even draw up a plan for a ridiculously short period of time, say a thousand years and is moreover unable to ensure his own safety for even the next day. And indeed here, the stranger turned to, to uh, Berlioz, uh, suppose you were to start controlling others and yourself. And just as you developed a taste for it, so to speak, you suddenly went and well, Got lung cancer, at which point the foreigner chuckled merrily as if he thought of lung cancer brought him some pleasure. Yes, cancer, he repeated, and narrowing his eyes like a cat as he savored the sonorous word. And there goes your control. No one's fate is of any interest to you except your own. Right. Your relatives start lying to you. Wouldn't it be more correct to say that someone other than himself is in control? And at this point, the stranger laughed a strange sort of laugh. Um, And then we get, and then later on. Our brand, but rather by the cigarette case itself, it was enormous, made of pure gold. It was as it was being opened, the blue and white fire of a diamond triangle sparkled on its cover. So it's what's another thing that's interesting is that the depiction of the depiction of Satan is one of 
there's there's perfume there's sensuous pleasure there's yeah. the there's later the ball there's uh various costumes he's presented the with money black, the, the money the, the, yeah the tricks made with money yeah he's he's presented with like black silk stockings he's got a sword instead of a cane um and he's but but he's not seen as a trickster i mean behemoth is the trickster right um but he's and that's part of this sort of anti-trinity that's in the book but um but you know, I think that it's it's just interesting that um, where the guy ends up. They start mentioning schizophrenia, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a way. Um, that's a way again. The book, um, uh, the clinic, that is another c uh, central place within this book, is that is the go to maneuver when anybody actually encounters the devil, when any actually encounters evil, and then tries to articulate the experience. Which again, as you as a reader, as you're moving through the book, you know that they're telling the truth. They are met with the description as that they're mentally ill or they're schizophrenic, yes. demonstrating again the the in inversion of Soviet Russia that this immense atheistic rationalistic society in fact is so divorced from reality what do you think one of the things that's striking to me in this book is that <clears throat> um oftentimes in literature you know we're 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 always presented with a speaker so someone yeah. is always not it's not even it, it sort of supersedes the idea of a narrator um the speaker is a character himself and this book is unlike many others that I've done here and in the canon because because the speaker seems to be both. I mean, the minute that again, the minute that the writer puts the pen to page, it, a character is developed. But this is like a sort of a almost like transcendent, self transcendent version of Bulgakov himself, who is yes. the master in the book. Yes, and that that that's fluid throughout the rest of the book and it's, and it's sort of contiguous because we're presented with so many situations from so many different angles and so many different viewpoints it, we go we we're it's non-linear we we skip through time we skip yes. through you know the the basis things and the highest things and so who can tell us this this story well it has to be from the voice of the writer is it because and that, that's particularly true because if we're discussing, you know, this isn't a, a third person, all knowing narrator. It's someone who's in the narrative right. and Satan is actually described as being omnipotent at the end of this. Um, and yet he is subject to Christ. Yes, right? exactly. He's, I was going to say, but he has to. It, and that's another thing is the person who believes the most in Christ is Satan. And then it becomes, well, obviously, Matthew Levi, again, that he has this false representation of Matthew. And then it's Pontius Pilate. Out of right. all the characters in the whole book, it's Satan, Pontius Pilate, and Matthew that have the most faith that Christ is actually who he says he is. Yeah. And and so at the end of chapter one, we're presented with the wh who is Woland uh, in the somebody says classic sweater, BLA. Thank you. Yes, I thought I'd wear my festive Christmas sweater. I counteract. didn't get the memo. He didn't let me know yeah, I... to counteract some of the darkness in this book. Right. Um, but I made up. a Okay. So, all right. Side note. I made up a, you want to hear a dad joke for idea yeah. for a movie that all I made right. up this week. All right. Get ready to get ready to chuckle. Okay. So, and this is comfortable with the book because behemoth is a cat. So here's my idea for a, for a movie. Okay. So, so St. Nick is delivering a cat to someone right at, on Christmas, the cat gets out of the bag. But then when St. Nick goes back up the chimney, right? The cat tries to go back up, gets burned in the fire in the chimney, comes back down. And now he's Santa Claus. Get it. And he's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's making, he's making a hiss and checking it twice. Better find out if you're naughty or mice. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. This is becoming Thank a cat you. and mouse game. <laughs> so so at the end of chapter one we're presented with what woland is doing and he's a professor of black magic so alistair crowley enters the chat right woland woland is a is a is a crowley-esque character in this uh because yeah. he puts on but he puts on stage shows and it, it it reminds me of a lot of the themes of uh the prestige i did a, a book analysis um of the movie the prestige i mean of the book the prestige and then the film um and also houdini and there's a lot of time spent like in this book of of you know trying to debunk the black magician uh on the stage and 
it also turns into at, at at one point it turns into Hess's Steppenwolf, Poe's Mask of the Red Death, and the Decameron all in one because we have this procession through a kind of eyes wide shut party mixed uh -huh. in with a carnival. Um, and at the end of this uh, first chapter, he says, um, and again, the, both the editor and the poet were completely dumbfounded. The professor motioned to both of them to come closer. And when they had, he whispered, keep in mind that Jesus did exist. And then he ends up saying, no proof is required, answered the professor. He began to speak softly. And as he did, his accent somehow disappeared. It's all very simple. And then we have the entryway into the narrative because uh, this is kind of a functions as a prologue early in the morning on the 14th day of the spring month of uh, Nissan wearing a white cloak with a blood red lining and shuffling with his cavalryman's gait. And then that begins the second chapter and then enters the procurator of Judea Pontius Pilate. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about what happens in chapter two? Cause this is one of the key chapters. Um, Cause this is the, where the procurator is questioning Christ. Um, yeah. So do you want to take us through sort sure. of what happens? Here? So in chapter two, um, interestingly, Bogokov uses Aramaic words for everything. Hmm. So um, interesting move there. Again, it's not totally a biblical narrative, but we are introduced to Pontius Pilate, who is plagued by a headache. And we see characters in the book get headaches when they're either in front of Christ, so Pontius Pilate is the only one, but then the people who encounter Roland or Wolin, I keep calling him Wolin, the Satan. And um, I don't know if this is a recognition of the sort of dizziness of pure rationality encountering transcendence uh, or something like that. But uh, chapter two, so it's all about this sort of re crafting Christ's conversation with Pontius Pilate about truth, about his guilt and all this different stuff. Um, and, and this is going to set the tone because that you really don't know why he's going here. But uh, once we flash into chapter three, Wolin is highlighting that I was there. I was present sort of it's signifying, although the reader doesn't know definitely yet, and certainly the characters in the book haven't recognized, but Wolin is Satan, and that's why he's able to be somewhere two millennia ago. Um, but he's he's sort of recrafting this narrative. Um, and again, in, in this section, uh, Christ makes a comment that Matthew Levi, though a faithful follower, gets everything wrong when he writes it down. And you're like, hmm. And I'm not sure, I still haven't even wrapped my mind about why exactly Bulgakov does that because it, towards the end we see that it's not Wolin's story. Because that's right. what you think of, at least what I did when I was first reading the book. Well, you move is, through, go ahead. Does you move he it. do this because that's one of the one of the driving forces in why he ends up burning the book? In other words, so the the story is the central story in human history yes right it's the most important thing of all time and so if this guy is both trying to break it down for the average reader and put it in terms of like a commonplace you know legalistic testimonial but also trying to contain the hugeness of this the 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 invisible hugeness of it right the the beyond the here and now where the two people are talking about it then it kind of makes sense to me that uh, because part of the theme is the struggling artist, right? I mean, he, he, and he does, the master struggles, he's poor. He has, he's, he's starving and he's starving for his art, but his art is centered on this one thing, right? Mm -hmm. This one book. So it makes sense that in, in the kind of spirit of, I can never get this right. I'll never get this. It's already been written by the way. And it's perfect, right? It's God's word. And I'm just trying to do this other thing. It makes sense that, in a moment of guilt or imperf imperfection that the whole thing gets burned. It also reminds me of um, the Tempest because at the end of the Tempest, you know, um, uh, Prospero, who's a wizard, a magician will bury his book full fathom five. Right. It, and that's, that's Shakespeare saying that I've completed my opus. Now I'm burying the book. I'm both burying it in, literature and in history but also i have nothing else to write and so part of this the thing here is that margarita wants him to finish the book you know she wants him to write the book where's the book she she sort of, sort of exists as his like physical alive muse 
right. who wants him to rewrite this thing. But I still, like you said, I, I still, it's difficult to sort of wrap your head around why he, why this happens. In the book. Yeah. Uh, I am under the uh, impression that Bogakov, like his wife is Margarita for his work. Cause he got so depressed. I think he had a amphetamine, uh, addiction yeah. of some morphine. Yeah. yeah. Morphine. morphine. He's got a book called morphine. Yeah. And, um, she admits because Stalin personally didn't want Bogakov's work to be published, although he wasn't cruel to him. And so Bogakov had like a nice life um, yeah. and he was an artist, but he wasn't able to have the impact on the society he lived in due to, again, the, the hierarchical structure of the Soviet Union. And so when we're looking at chapter two here, because this is going to connect later in the book when Matthew Levi is in front of Pontius Pilate after Pontius Pilate kills Judas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> um both christ and matthew levi don't recognize the authority of Pilate, not in a mean way but matthew levi uh doesn't he asked him to take a seat and he sits on the floor instead yeah. uh, demonstrating that he even though yeah you're pontius Pilate and you have the official force again the hierarchical force that's here i have courage in relationship to the truth that I know, which is Christ, right? And so Christ has a point, a line in this uh, chapter two, where he mentions that the temple of the old faith would fall and a new temple of truth would be built. And and so Christ says, I said, I said it that way so as to make it more understandable. But this is this conversation that is going back and forth. And so Bogakov is trying to get people to recognize that they need to have courage in face of like actual worldly authority to actually make a change because the so Moscow, the Soviet Russia, it is so um, watered down by people just getting along, you know, happy to just get along and be their official role and whatever the status is given them. And yet at the same time, it's not some communist utopia. Everybody, because they don't believe in God, they don't recognize good and evil. They're just in it for their own pleasure and what they can get out of it. And so even though it's this bureaucratic um, Gestapo like structure of power, the people aren't in it because of the communist ideals you see people marching and asking for now. No, they live in that. And it's nothing like that. Everybody right. is out for themselves and trying to get what they can. Nobody actually owns anything. So when Berlioz, because a central place in this book is his apartment and even his own uncle, who, again, Satan says he's going to send him a letter like telling he tells Berlioz that you're going to lose your head here in just a moment, which he does. He dies, loses his head. He says, I'm going to send a letter to your uncle in Kiev. And so it turns out Behemoth, the cat, writes a letter. And he says it was in perfect Russian, wasn't it? When his uncle finally comes to the uh, come to the apartment that the the uncle, knowing that his nephew had died, came all the way from Kiev to Moscow, not actually for the funeral, but to secure his apartment because it was such a prized possession. I want the apartment. It contains toilet paper and caviar. That's my Russian <laughs> accent. Um, no, no, but yeah, and this is this is part of we see this in all the in all the Russian films, right? Uh, yeah. I, I recently saw this in, in the James Bond movie Octopussy, where where the 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 common turn or whoever is meeting and they talk about the decadence of the Russian, you know, uh, high council, you know, and, and this is also in the Khrushchev book, you know, it's like you secure all these, all these pleasures for yourself. Like you said, um, uh, Jesse also, um, says was Bulgakov in, were you sure Bulgakov was into Crowley? I didn't say that. I didn't say Bulgakov was into Crowley. I'm saying that it is Crowley in, in terms of our analysis of how the character appears in the book. In fact, I did look for that to see if the two had ever crossed paths and I can't find anything that they, I want to make a comment. Uh, Caravaggio said, is it really any wonder Stalin loved this book and personally approved his publication? Well, from my understanding, he did not. The book was published in the 1966 by his widow. And this was after the death of Stalin because Stalin personally did not want this book published that's what caused Bolkakov to be so upset with the fact that he thought this was a, a master work and that they wouldn't let him publish it that that's why he burned it but that's, then what, he that's why the, rewriting it. the dates for the book are like 11 years right um yeah. and 
Um, yeah, uh, Crispy says the this part in the book is like the book of Nicodemus. Um, and and that keeps being mentioned. Um, and I think that I think that with st- imagine the pressure Bulgakov is under, right? So one, yeah, he's chilling. He's a morphine addict, you know, which was occurred from a, a war wound, I think. Um, and he's a young. There's a, there is one movie about Bul- or a TV show about Bulgakov with the guy who plays Harry Potter. Interesting because Harry Potter is the young the story of the young al crowley um, right. no but he plays a a young you know he's got the other book about the young doctor um and but he's under all this pressure his wife is if his wife is margarita i i'm not sure what to say about that she's she's wild in this book margarita well, yeah wild. i don't know if his wife but in regards yeah. to the relationship to the manuscript mm-hmm. because you have to remember the manuscript that's being described in this book which is according to the book about pontius pilate is really Bulgakov's manuscript himself, the Master Margarita. This is this is the headiest possible subject that you can you can choose for a book, and he's writing it, and Stalin takes interest in this, right? It must be incredible pressure. I mean, <laughs> what's he going to say? <laughs> you know? Well, Uh-oh. he didn't he didn't hate it, so Caravaggio yeah. because he didn't actually uh, hurt Bulgakov. So he liked it enough that Bogakov had, you know, he lived a decent life. He wasn't like mm-hmm. he was poor. He was allowed to be an artist. He was able to publish some stuff that went international. So he had a prestige. So uh, international currency plays a huge part in this book. Well, Bogakov was one of the few Russians into the Soviet era that had international currency from sales of some of his art. Right. But his thing is that in what he's describing in this book about the courage thing is that he has works that the Soviet Union will not let him publish, i.e. the manuscript to this book. And um, it was really depressing for him, clearly. And so his apparently his wife was the only person that believed that this book was also like a masterpiece. And that's why she wanted him to rewrite it when he burned it. And she published it after he was dead. Um, back in chapter two... Just a couple of excerpts from this chapter. Um, one is when Pilate is questioning him and it says, the Roman government did not infringe upon the rights of the local religious authorities as the high priest well knew, but this in particular, but in this particular instance, an obvious mistake seemed to have been made. And naturally the Roman governor government had an interest in correcting that mistake. And then they start talking about Barabbas. Um, and then the language here is interesting because um, it says, then he looked around, surveyed the world that was visible to him and was amazed at the change that had occurred. The rose bush, this is potent symbolic language, the rose bush laden with flowers had vanished as had the cypresses bordering the upper terrace and the pomegranate tree and the white statue and the foliage, even the foliage itself. In place of all this floated a crimson sediment in which seaweed began to sway and move somewhere and Pilate moved along with it. Now he was engulfed by the most terrible rage of all, rage that choked and burned him, the rage of powerlessness. And then he goes on to say say things like weeping and groaning, um, uh, raging inside this flame were roaring shrieks, groans, laughter, whistling. Um, a raven black horse shed and reared up on its hind legs. Uh, and then finally at the end of the chapter, raising a cloud of dust, uh, the Allah tore down the lane and the last one to ride past pilot was a soldier with a trumpet on his back that glowed in the sun. And shielding his face from the dust with his hand and frowning with dissatisfaction, Pilate moved on, heading for the gates of the palace garden and following behind him were the legate of the legion, the secretary and the escort. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. The 10 o'clock in the morning is supposed to be the commonplace ask, you know, d- depiction of like, I was there and this is when it happened. But what I wrote was in the days that- are happening simultaneously. Right. So it's, it's yes. psychedelic. Right. Because it's also 10 in the morning in moscow that's right it's psycho psychedelic uh surrealistic and very trippy man <laughs> <laughs> but i wrote um the time gives common and commonplace evidential legalistic context and a take on the most central event in human history and um that satan is a ban- is a witness to the prince of peace the passion crucifixion and resurrection of christ um, uh, which is, which is crazy. I mean, it's crazy in this book, um, just in terms of the imagery to imagine, you know, this is part of the climb. This is like a part of paradise lost also is that Christ, uh, is that Satan makes his way into the garden, um, in order to subvert Christ, you know, God's creation, 
right? right. Um, and then that during the crucifixion on the place of the skull that Satan is there watching, right? Which is, is, is. Which Bald obviously. Mountain, I found, is another term for Golgotha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I, because I was wondering, why would, why do you keep using Bald Mountain? So I had to look into it. And it's actually another term. I forget. It's like a local term for for that mountain. Some people call it. It's like Calvary, Golgotha, and I guess Bald Mountain is another term. So, uh, so it's weird. And even with like uh, your Shleim for Jerusalem, I guess that's the Aramaic presentation. So he's using real names, but he's using them in such a non familiar way that they feel different, more different. And it- it ties into the web of words that he creates in this book yes. because the because the the language and the symbolic imagery and the literal and the figurative all sort of coalesce here because there's a constant mention throughout the book again of heads yes right uh bald you know bald heads heads being chopped off and here yeah. we have and rationality the, and being limited yes, by it right right losing one's head losing one's sense of sense of place losing yeah. one's rationale because he what he's playing on is that it's actually the opposite of what you think he's saying that if you don't recognize the supernatural you actually can't see what's going on and so as you become more rational which you, again what soviet union was priding itself or at least the ideals of communism is that that you're going to create a more equal and just and fair society is that it's quite the opposite you become more and more blinded and you become more and more self-interested because you you make you're going to make rational arguments for oneself so we peop, we see people constantly and so when they encounter satan they're always they're always uh, proposition based on what their weakness is mm-hmm. um and the difference is the people who take it and the people who don't and and one of the most undeserving characters in the whole book that do nothing wrong is the man who runs the uh the bar at the theater and he is going to he's told that he has nine months to live and he's going to have liver cancer. And in the epilogue, we're told that that's exactly what happened is he dies after nine months. But he's one of the only characters that recognizes immediately Satan when he sees him and also does not take him up on his offer. He's so the one who mentions Christ. He's the, is, yeah. he's the one who says Jesus Christ in the book. Right. Um there is a there is a part and it's in the ironic, end where he runs a bar, right? So you think right. of debauchery and stuff, but again, where he's pull, pulling on opposites, it's actually the man who runs the bar at the theater. That's where all the fine, wealthy people, you know, the high Soviet uh, Russians in the society are able to have fun. It's actually him that can see the world the most clearly. This is also part of the set, the brilliant satire that he sort of weaves throughout the narrative because it's relevant now. This is now because, like you said, people are. Uh, they, they are met with temptation in the way that is most useful to them that they want the most. And right. so that plays into the sort of blackmail aspects of this. And, and Satan and, always and, takes advantage of you. So right. he, you never actually get a good deal, except for Margarita, who did it because of love and not because of self-interest. Although it kind of is, but it, in a way it's not. Um, in chapter three here, the seventh. Yeah, you want to you, you try to just give an overview up to where I guess uh, <clears throat> Ivan's in the insane asylum. Yeah. Um, he, um, <clears throat> in this, what happens in this, cha- this is a pretty notable chapter in this chapter. Um, here's where we get Satan say, I'm, I myself witnessed the whole thing. I was there on Pontius Pilate's balcony and in the garden when he was talking with Kaifa and on the platform too, but I was there in secret incognito, so to speak. So I beg you, keep it quiet and don't breathe a word to his soul. Shh. Yeah, he says. And then basically uh, the guy, it says, suddenly stopped laughing. And as often happens to the mentally ill. So he goes schizophrenic. Yep. Um, he's obviously in a deranged state. And then he gets there's the cart that happens. There's the moon flash. The moon is is incredibly powerful in this because I, I read all the moon references. The moonlit night is restless. Um, therein lay the charm of this journey up the stairway of the moon. Um, I, I never got ending. a good explanation for the symbolism of the sunflower oil. Mm. And I don't know, maybe I wanted to pose that to you, but um, as we move out of three and into chapter four, so Berlioz, Berlioz loses, loses his head. Right? Yeah. He loses his head as told by Wall and Satan to him that he was going to. And so a woman who turns out to live underneath Berlioz's apartment um, and she plays a factor at the end of the, of, of the book she spills sunflower oil on the ground, causing him to slip at the same time that the train cart is coming and cuts his head off right then and there. 
so I guess what's the symbolism? I guess that uh it's not fatalistic, it's that the it's that the commonplace objects number one, the commonplace objects will play a part in the eventual um re whatever the, the eventual punishment or the eventual losing of, of one's head. Um right that the guy walks and then the cart comes and then the sunflower oil and then he slips and then his head is chopped off. Yeah. Um the other I guess is I mean the there's so much lunar imagery right, right. it's ironic it's only that, solar images of the right, light. It's, it's That's what I was thinking that, is that it's the light it's mm -hmm. using it as a metaphor for sunflower oil that causes Berlioz to slip up and lose his head and so the light exposes the shortcomings and in the and it it's the light or the sunflower oil that then sets the whole book in motion of of the domino effect that occurs because without Berlioz losing his head you don't get the whole planopy of mm -hmm. uh, his magic show Moscow going crazy the funeral the uncle everybody going to his apartment. Um, this this chapter the chase also includes a single ray of moonlight filtered through a dusty window and then is countered with broken zigzags of light and that is going to occur at the that is tied up at the end of the book where the master can't he's not accepted into the light but only into peace right again like we like we mentioned at the beginning um and god what what happens in this next section um we have so, the ins here, insane uh, asylum we've got the yeah well let me go through and then you tell me yeah. where to stop so after Berlioz then loses his head, we have Ivan, homeless, a poet, a writer of the Mazalit Society, who's prominent, but very self-doubting at this point. And he kind of references the reality of Jesus Christ, which also set this whole thing in motion. He then sees that this guy, Wolin, this mysterious foreigner, said this was going to happen. It did happen. And so he runs out of the, the sort of train station uh, and looks for... Wolin, which he sees um, Kurvyov and Behemoth and him sort of walking down the stream, but he can't catch up with him. And he didn't see the other two. He was just engaging with Wolin. But then he sees the cat walking on two feet, calling for a cab and, get, and gets in it himself. Right. So he, he's, he's like, what is going on? Um, and this eventually leads into a scene where he's trying to follow them goes into an apartment building, stumbles upon, goes through a, a, a random room, stumbles upon a naked lady, grabs a candle, a la chrismation, a la being newly illumined, and um, goes out the back door, uh, jumps in the river with his candle. It's not lit. Jumps in the river, gets out of the river. He Somehow he loses his clothes, and he sees basically a homeless man's clothes sitting there next to the river and puts them on. And so he's recognized... He, he he hasn't he doesn't know it's satan and he really doesn't want it, want his mind to go there but this yeah. ivan guy is chasing what he perceived to be woland in this group of characters and eventually he makes his way back to uh where the mazalit society is going to have their dinner where all the literati and all the writers but none of them actually write anything authentic because none of them have courage and so therefore all of the things that they put out is propaganda by the soviet union well you get to see that they live this gluttonous life they're in this huge ballroom the the nicest utensils the nicest uh, champagnes and wines um and then eventually ivan gets there looking like a bum with a candle and and in his underpants with a ripped up white shirt so again, white, I would associate that with like a chrismation, a baptism, a new absolution. And uh, they're like, dude, what are you doing? They call the police and they're like, you're going to have to come with us. And so he gets taken then to the mental institute or the clinic. And he's still trying to explain what he just saw to the doctor and all the people, all the people working in the Soviet Union. And they're like, it's all right, buddy. Um, we, we think you're, you're, you're going through a schizophrenic episode, right? So he goes through a baptism, a, a sort of ritual initiation, a baptism of blood goes through a baptism in the river, emerges poor, right? He's flipped in terms of his personality. Now they see him as insane. And I think that if I was to 
you know, analyze this in terms of the relevance. Now I would say that all the details are, are significant, but they kind of, it's kind of allegorical for the way that, um, in the, in the seeking of truth, let's just call it in the seeking of truth. Mm -hmm. Like, even if it were in terms of geopolitical events or, you know, the, the, the truth, man, they were in the tunnels. (laughs) Um, it, it functions in the same way that the things are so unbelievable and yet they happen and they're witnessed in the empirical sense that yes. when you when you are forced to in a situation to describe why you Perfect. appear yeah. the way you do, no one will believe you because it's inherent in the events that they're unbelievable. Right. So one has to witness them in order it's to, for them to happen. That the 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 perpetual use of only rationality prevents yes. them from seeing it as well. Right. With and they were they were all rationale. They were all you know, uh, uh, concrete details, you know, the things that exist are here and now, and this book and, you know, this, and there's no metaphysics. Right. And yet when they witness it, no one believes them. Right. So it's, again, it's inherent in the very notion of the argument at the beginning that there's something beyond the concrete happening right now. There's the world of ideas, which is interesting because they're arguing about ideas. Right. Um, and, and, and the beginning of the, but book. in a way um, they're not because they only state what the Soviet union wants them to write. That's true. Yeah. So in a, in a way, they don't engage with it, at least. And that's their lack of courage. And that's what Bulgakov is trying to make the criticism of these of the art, artistry of the Soviet Union is that they, they lack courage. And therefore, that what they write doesn't map on to reality. And I think that's why we can read this book right now and make clear references to life in 2023 America. This is 1946 mm-hmm. Moscow, Russia. Yeah. Um, because, but Bogakov is trying to say when manuscripts don't burn, is that when it's truthful and it's authentic art and it's real and you are speaking it as as well as you can to describe what you're seeing, that lives on because the truth is eternal. Um, the the chapter chapter six schizophrenia as predicted is a. Uh... This is an important, um, which, which chapter 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 six. That's the one I was on too. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter Uh uh, all you can go to the devil. Um, uh, then Ivan says the Lord be praised. And then, uh, bottom of this page, uh, Roykin was red breathing heavily and thinking of only one thing that he nursed a viper to his breast and shown kindness to someone who turned out to be a vicious enemy when put to the test. Mm. They grabbed me, tied me up in rags, dragged me off in a truck, um, later on, he can do things that would make your flesh crawl. Next page, there's the icon, right? Um, the icon was what scared them most of all. Yes, Ivan says he's in league with evil powers. He was there with Pontius Pilate. You have my word of it. And then they they administer, I guess it's morphine. They give yeah, morphine. they, they put him in a sedative. He's like, oh. Yeah, hypodermic syringe. Oh, well, let me Alex, uh, introduce that character, though, because uh, that way everybody can follow us. Is Alexander Rukin is the poet that brings Ivan to Dr. Stravinsky's psychiatric clinic. And what we didn't mention is that he becomes tormented by the fact that Ivan, in this state of frenzy where he's describing, trying to say the most truthful thing that he can, turns to him and basically tells him that he's inauthentic, he lacks courage, and everything he writes sucks. (laughs) You don't know the truth, man. I've seen some things and some stuff, man. (laughs) Okay, so, here's some morphine. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. uh-huh. and, and so he says his poetry is bad because he doesn't actually believe in anything he writes. It's not authentic. Mm-hmm. And as the night's in, he mourns the loss of the night of fun and feasting he couldn't have had, he could have had at uh, Gorbadev is where the Mazalet meeting is. This, this Gorbadev, you can think of this, the most intricate, beautiful ballroom in Moscow. And so... In exchange, again, to not speaking truth, the Mazalit, the literati, the, the artistry community of Moscow, they are given luxurious lives. They get to dress up in these beautiful tuxes and suits, and they get the finest of everything, but they can't actually be real people. And in, again, we can see this exchange in our life right now because the underlying message of Bogakov is that it's those who choose uh, the material, be it sex or money, um, always lose. And he's saying that's basically yeah. what the problem with the Soviet Union is, that the people who choose something that isn't material, the master who's writing the manuscript, Margarita, uh, who actually are both married, uh, both of them are committing adultery in this relationship of love they have. 
but because they chose love, um, they actually get to keep it. It's not a joke and it's real. It's authentic. It's a real force. You can see this in the now in the literati and in academia with the um, saying that the poet is not speaking truth. And so he's inauthentic because everyone knows this now. What happens is that the artists who you can't have great art without a basis in truth. Right. Even if you're writing lyric poems um, with, you know, with concrete imagery, it, it ends up being so much trash, right? Because yeah. you have the abstract uh, towing the line, whether it's political or the literary, literary movement, or this is like what uh, T.S. You know, Eliot said about Edward Ar Arlington Robinson. It's like, you know, you have the poet who gets all the awards, who is like the weather vane, as opposed to the poet who is making, you know, who is tapped into the dialed into the weather, man. You know what, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so it's the same thing in academia. It's like, there are only so many academics who do true research or who do who write books based in actual truth, you know, with factual evidence and then talking about truth um, on top of that, who are regaled. Everyone else is to, you see it, you see it on with, you know, you see it everywhere. You see it in culture now where, um, you know, uh, people, I mean, people who do book streams, um, where they never open the book and the book is, I've never heard of the book. I've never, uh, you know, the, the book is never open. It looks like a cardboard book and they're inside of a factory talking about my book haul, get 10 million views. Right. right? It's the, it's the same thing. Um, there's a, an, well, and look experience. at the media right now. So, uh, I don't know just that if you saw some of the highlights from the GOP debate last night, but Vivek Ramaswamy made some ripples. Yeah. And again, we know how fraudulent that whole thing is in the whole process. But our establishment, the Overton window, uh, our media sources, we are becoming more and more and more and more like the situation that Bulgakov is trying to warn us from, in which uh, truth can actually be expressed to its fullness because it always threatens the hierarchy because Christ again did not recognize the worldly hierarchy of Pontius Pilate and neither did his follower Matthew the only two that really are are in a full understanding of like what they're standing up for um do you want to I'm going to skip ahead here and go yeah. to <laughs> chapter 7 is where behemoth and um Azazello appear and this is interesting because <laughs> We've got uh, the professor of black magic and then the description of Behemoth, a black cat of horrific. Which, which chapter are you in? This is chapter seven. Okay. The evil apartment. Yeah. Which, what chapter is your favorite? 12 is mine. The magic. Um, my, my favorite is the, the, the ball. The ball. Um, that's a good, yeah. Those yeah, are the two so, best. Yeah. Those. So, so candlelight is an excellent passage that probably what I think is the best in terms of how it's written. Yeah. In terms of the most patent uh, potent is either the fate of the master and Margarita is decided or when we get the descriptions of Margarita as a witch, I think it, that yeah. that's, it's and very this was an interesting thing too. Did you, I don't know, maybe you knew this, but it's uh, Azazello who gives the cream to Margarita. Yeah. And Azazel is the demon of like female cosmetics and makeup. Mm -hmm. I yeah, um, did not know that. I was well, looking that up. I was like, well, well, that is interesting. That's another great we, little thing that Bulgakov throws in. Um, should we, you want to skip to that and then we can come back to stuff. Um, let's skip. I just want to skip to, uh, is this by candlelight? Um, where is it where she becomes a witch? Um, because they start talking about the fifth um, dimension. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, the the fifth dimension is when she goes to the ball because the room, the apartment building. Okay. So before that is. Before that, it's Azazello's Cream, Chapter 20. Okay. Let me find it real quick here. And because this one is. Um, beautiful god I've, this, i tore apart this book it's like <laughs> i can't find anything because of all the notes um here it is yeah okay <laughs> zello's cream all right so so this one's interesting so we're gonna we're gonna skip ahead and then we'll come back to stuff because the the narrative is also non-linear anyway we kind of skip forward in time so we can we can do that um so as zello's cream 
Uh, it starts off, and there was a mention in one of the earlier chapters of the W being two Vs. Uh, yes, it was a well, small in, reference in the Masters, the inversion of Wolin because they have the same. It's it's just a W and an M. Uh -huh. Wolin has the W. The Master had an, a yellow M. Yeah, but I and got this, the impression that it's it's signifying that somehow there's a connection there too. It's also tying in with the fact that in in English. You know, we have this sort of archaic sense of this, what the witch, what Margarita is going to become a witch. And it's something ancient. We get, we later, we get a discussion of Abaddon and like the beasts of the abyss. And so these are, these are creatures from beyond time, right? They're from right. before humanity. And so, so the language is supposed to reflect that. Um, and as, and also I, I just, there's so much in here with this movie, the witch. Um, and it, so it starts off. The full moon hung in the clear evening sky, visible through the branches of a maple tree. The lindens and acacias traced an intricate pattern of spots on the garden floor. I mean, even those those few sentences are brilliant to me because, and then later at the end of the paragraph, the room smelled of perfume is a rhyme. There's an internal rhyme in the sentence. And from somewhere came the smell of a red hot iron. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's very powerful writing. It's almost Shakespe yes. Shakespearean because even though this is in translation, um, the, the it still holds when you have the the writer in translation that it becomes its own work of art and and all of the images in this paragraph are almost like they're they're like um the witch going the woman going through the ritual initiation and every object is potent it holds some sort of symbolism for, yeah. towards the initiation yeah. so we've got the moon hanging in the sky it becomes a full moon we we have talk of nature um, the garden floor, we've got the garden, garden of Gethsemane references. And then we've got like a sort of later on, there's talk of the parquet floor and then it becomes a sort of a checkerboard. There was the zigzag of light. And then we have the, the concrete imagery of the, the like olfactory images of perfume mixed in with heat from a hellish heat, a red hot iron. Yeah. Um, and, and, then, and in this chapter, I was going to say, um, female intuition because margarita mm. the chapter before so this book is divided in two books there's part one part two the first chapter of part two which is, is interesting because it's like the it's like old and new testament in a way mirrored in the book well right? and and it's a and a rare occurrence where the biggest person in the entire book margarita is only half the book and it's only the second mm -hmm. half Right. right. So you see Volgakov throws so much into this book. I highly do recommend reading this book at some point in your life. Um, but chapter, I think it's uh, 19 is the first chapter of this of part two. And so we see that Margarita, we're introduced to Margarita. She's in love with the master. Both of them are married. Uh, they fell in love with each other when they first when they first met. We see and they she had like yellow flowers. So we see, I, mm -hmm. I took that as sunflower imagery. Sunflower. Yeah, yeah, she doesn't say sunflower, but they're yellow something. But that's what in my mind I connected those. And um, Margarita tells the housekeeper. So her husband, she's married to a man who gives her every material thing. So unlike the other people, like the literati in the Soviet Union, um, she has everything she needs. She has a beautiful house. She has a housekeeper. She has like the most magnificent wardrobe, which plays into when we get to the devil or Satan's uh, black magic seance he does in the theater is he drops money from the ceiling and people yeah. do everything for it. And the women clamor to get the nicest dresses. Like he's mentioning Chanel back in this yeah. book. So 1946 Moscow, the women still wanted to buy Chanel. I thought that like, I was like, Oh, wow, that's funny. Um, <laughs> but um, we're introduced to Margarita and we've already been moved to the master and the psych uh, clinic in part one. But Margarita tells her housekeeper, so we know that she's she's really not interested in all this all the material things that her husband can give her. But her husband's not there. He's working probably probably for the Soviet Union somewhere. And so she's in this house by herself. In her heart, she loves the master and she believes in his manuscript. And she like is doing everything. And she tells Natasha that something's going to happen today. She goes and gets on the bus, and Azazello is there, and he makes it clear that um, he's obviously a supernatural creature by knowing yes. all these things about her. But she is like, 
right off the get-go kind of getting the picture and she's with it and he tells her to give this uh put this cream and that she's been chosen out of all the margaritas in moscow for this ball with uh this very uh special monsieur uh woland and so yeah you don't want to come across as a zello on the public city bus <laughs> so cool yeah. with this one fang smack <laughs> Right. <laughs> Smack you with the power of the Lord. Um, shouts out, <laughs> shouts out to KF in the chat. She mentions a mimosa. It was a mimosa flower. Hey, Synchro, I'm drinking a an energy mimosa flavored drink. It's not uh, it doesn't have alcohol. Not like it matters, but I'm not. That's you know, an interesting connection. Flavor. Though, what are the chances? Oh, thank you, KF. Mimosa flower. Thank yeah. you so much, um, KF. So when people are so, following along with us. I yes, can't tell if we're so being too uh, detailed or if this is actually interesting. Listen, we're doing a, a wizard does exactly what he's supposed to. That's my, that's my <laughs> Ian McKellen Gandalf voice. <laughs> I keep seeing the, the AI memes of, of Gandalf after the rave. Have you seen those where, where yeah. Gandalf is? The, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, no, we're, 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 I think we're doing well. So, um, all right. Shout so, out to everybody in the chat. Please, please um, smash, smash the like. like people. Uh, also, by the way, you know, I put, um, DPH's uh, handle right there in the title. I mean, everybody here is already, but if there's somebody watching later, um, I put DPH's handle in the title and also in the video description. So please go and sub to our friend, David Patrick Harry here, church of the eternal logos. And please uh, think about sending some support. All the links are in the <laughs> video description and in the chat description. We'll get to those at the end. Jason says BLA drinking a four pack of sparks. <laughs> Tall boy. That's right. That's right. I got that steel reserve boy. I called, I called DPH. I was like, you want to do master and margarita? I'm drinking steel reserve. Um, <laughs> so. Oh shit. All right. So, uh, chapter 20, then what, what yeah. I was trying to tee you up is that now she's getting ready to put the cream on that Azazello gave her, which she knows she doesn't know what it's going to do, but, but she knows that that dude was onto something and he was very supernatural and that she's been chosen and she just in her heart knows that somehow this is tied to her getting back to the master. And that's what I was yeah. tying it into the female intuition is that this whole second thing is because somehow Margarita, she's willing to do all these things again. Then that's the courage that um, uh, Bogakov is trying to say. And that's why I say love is actually a force because it's her courage because her intuitive uh, love for him knows that somehow these process, but at the same time, why it's not Christian is because she's making deals with the devil. Right. They're like, you want to sign this contract? She's like, yes. They're like, you don't even know what's in it. She's like, I'm all for it. <laughs> she, and they give her, as Azazella gives her the total opposite of Jamie's tallow cream in the Jay's analysis store. This is the total opposite. This is, if you've seen the witch, there's a, I can't really describe it too much, but there's a scene where um, the one of the family members gets taken away by the witch. And then we see the scene of the the witch in her hovel squanching and scorching the family member and then rubbing the body. It's a it's made of a, a human of innocence paste all over her body it's really sick and then she looks into the full moonlight in the in the you know in the maple tree limb or the elm tree and then starts floating that's how she flies and yep. that's exactly what happens here yep. um and, and also the, she, she's a bit, she's going to be bathed in blood multiple times yeah. people are going to rub blood on her um and her like skin Elizabeth she's only 30 Bathory. years old she this yeah. woman's 30 years old and her skin goes back to when she was 20 Mm -hmm. And then Natasha yes. comes in her, her housekeeper sees her and tells her how beautiful she looks. And again, she starts like floating a broomstick comes out of nowhere and she starts riding around. She starts flying. Yeah. She starts playing Quidditch. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, an external transhumanism, right? She is, she's, she's forever young. She's living forever. She's getting, she's has a, yeah. an eternal youth yep. because what I took this as the cream that the cream was probably the cream is made of this. I mean, there's no reason why it's not, this isn't Chanel cream. This right. is like making her so youthful that she floats above her body. Uh, figuratively she, you know, but then literally she floats and she can fly. She becomes and, a and demon. She's invisible if she wants to be. That's right. <laughs> yeah, just, just like Al Crow. <laughs> it's the story of Alistair Crowley. <laughs> this is, I always thought this was funny. He's walking down the street with some reporter 
And he says, mm, do you know that I can become invisible? <laughs> and the guy's like, I thought we were going to Wendy's, right? <laughs> and he's like, watch this. And the guy says, all of a sudden, Crowley appeared as a specter walking down the street. Um, and <laughs> by the way, did you know I gave Winston Churchill the V for victory sign? And the guy's like, look, man, I just want some McNuggies. All right. <laughs> um, no, but it says um, her eyebrows, which have been plucked thread thin at the ends, had thickened and now arched evenly over her eyes, mm -hmm. uh, which had become green. Her, it's interesting because green eyes and green symbolism appears. Con if you watch this channel, Green appears constantly in these books with demonic imagery. The emerald symbolism is constantly there. It was in Frankenstein. It's in, it's in American Psycho. It's in all these books. And it says, gone were the yellowish shadows around her temples and barely noticeable crow's feet at the outer corners of her eyes. Uh, there in the mirror, like you said, staring back at the 30-year-old Margarita was a 20-year-old woman with naturally curly black hair showing her teeth and laughing unrestrainedly. So she's looking at her sight, you know, she's, this is a psychic image, right? Where she's looking, she's going through the looking glass mm -hmm. and she's seeing herself as a youth having laughed her fill. It's a maniacal laughter. Margarita swept off her robe, scooped up a generous glob of the light greasy cream and began rubbing it vigorously all over her body, which immediately became rosy and began to glow. Um, she felt as if a needle had been removed from her brain. The muscles in her arms and legs got stronger, and then Margarita's body became weightless. She gave a little jump and stayed suspended in the air just above the carpet, and then she felt a slow downward pull. It was back on the ground. What a cream! What a cream! She says. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, oh, let's go ahead. I don't mean to keep going. I well, well, the next part, it just says that the cream had transformed more than her appearance, and now her whole body, every part of it, surged with joy. So what's happening here is that Margarita is feeling uh, the feminine sense of of liberation and freedom in her physical beauty, right? Right. I mean, this is cross boundaries, but especially it's a it's a feminine. This is a feminine transformation here, right. and that she she is she's starting to become weightless, and she, because she's lost the weight of guilt. And she feels what is liberty. She feels freedom. She's this absolute liberty so that she's free of even her earthly bounds and she can fly. Right. And then she's going to use this, of course, for the purposes of the master and the book. But she's going to it's interesting that she flies upwards in the air and eventually is going to end up in this hellish uh, satanic ball. Yeah, literally right? a satanic With, ball. <laughs> literally. Like, quite right. literally. Right. And so in regards to just doing this chapter before we jump back to part one, also after like during this period, she goes and writes a letter to her husband. So imagine being this guy, right? What now? He, he, he's, he's like, I had suspicions it. about her, but I didn't know it was this serious, <laughs> <laughs> but she, um, so this is like, again, the twofoldness of the sort of, ambiguity of good and evil bulgakov in in everything that's good except for christ and in a way matthew levi um but everybody else both does good and bad at the same time so she's committing adultery but she's also in love and is selfless for that authentic love so the the premise is that the love she has between the master is like genuine real love yeah. but she's already married she's committing adultery and now she's turning into a witch and she's just like, I'll read it right here. She writes him a, a letter or a little note and says, forgive me and forget me as soon as possible. I am leaving you forever. Do not look for me. It is useless. I've become a witch from the grief and calamities that have struck me. It's time for me to go. Farewell. Margarita. <laughs> like, he's like he's like too long didn't read too long didn't read bye bitch i was ready to get rid of your ass <laughs> no but um this is certainly there are, there are, this is where i would draw a, a a marked distinction between evil in this book and something like you know paradise lost because in that you know, grand book uh, verse, everything that Satan does is, f is directed towards liberty in a sense, because it's, he says, you know, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, but it's all directed towards the purpose of subverting God's creation because of anger and pr because of pride. Right? right. In this one, we have something a little bit, we have something different, which is that 
the human characters are also sort of mimic mimicking the way that the the devilish characters work because like i mean it says it in the very you know epigraph right which is yeah. that you think that they're going to be um everything they do will be evil right and it'll be it'll be totally black right. but it ends up being perfumed and and sensual and sensuous which is enough is, is truthful i think right it's because they they appeal to the passions um that enslave people and they appear in various guises and forms to tempt them um and she uh, on the next page there's just one part here where where she starts to fly margarita pulled the shade aside and sat sideways on the windowsill her hands clasped on on her knee the moonlight uh, caressed her right side margarita raised her head toward the moon and assumed a pensive and poetic expression very it it's again again this is like a this is like a masonic ritual or something right everything has a sort of a background and a and a and a pedigree in terms of what she's doing there's a lot about knees in this uh, yeah. as is, uh, satan has a burning knee right like as yeah. if he refuses to genuflect in front of god um and the people are constantly um uh, their legs hurt their knees hurt and in here she's it's like she's assuming this this um muse position to the moon uh, there's also obviously like you know diana artemis imagery here um yes the husband's like damn i, I knew you were going to the ren fair and you were kind of <laughs> weird right but you know this is too much um and she then she becomes invisible uh she becomes invisible and she flies um farewell natasha right she flew out over the gates and into the street and the totally crazed waltz followed her aloft so the waltz is interesting because it reminds me of obviously of eyes wide shot. Uh, this is like um, Schnitzler's uh, Trom Novel, the 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 dream story where, and it's the same in Mask of the Red Death. It's the same in Hesse's Steppenwolf, where we have this carnival that goes on with a kind of a demonic waltz, where the characters are dancing into a frenzy right. um, in subservience uh, to Satan. In the next chapter again, she you know begins invisible and free, invisible and free. <laughs> um, and then we, and then there's this chapter has a lot about, uh, th another, another one of the themes in this, which is that the, the physical buildings will be an exterior sign of the inner character states, right? So houses crumble, uh, windows get smashed, mirrors yeah. get broken, um, and moonlight and zigzagging imagery. You want to so, flip back to part one? Yeah. Yeah, let's flip back. Okay, so we left off where Ivan is in the psych ward. Mm -hmm. And this is all leading up to... So, obviously, nobody believes him. This was one of the guys sitting on the bench at Patriarch Pond. And um, crazy stuff happened the night before at the, the Mazalit when Ivan came. And so, now he's in the psych ward. And... They don't believe him. He ends up. What well, th this is? Isn't one of these chapters where uh, the the Wolin then shushes him, right? Because he's trying to. So I think it's like um, seven or eight, where yeah. Ivan's in the psych ward and he's sort of giving up because twice he's woken up and tried to explain to them that he still believes somebody needs to stop them from doing what they're doing. And they just sedate him again. More morphine. Yeah. <laughs> so like twice he like tries to tell people he gets sedated and he's kind of wheeled out in the community room, I guess. And like over on the veranda, it's at night and the nurse doesn't see. And out of her purview, Wolin is there, Satan, and he's looking at Ivan. So he's he can't he and he's kind of messed up. So he doesn't know if he's really seeing it or if he's not seeing it, but he's he's like doesn't like say anything out loud, but Wolin is shushing him because remember on the bench, he told him, don't tell anybody mm -hmm. about this. And he's trying to tell everybody, yeah. but everybody thinks he's crazy because he's actually speaking truth in a rationalistic, uh, authoritative society. And so this, and then there's this, during these chapters too, we see these, the, a few different, uh, characters brought in that work at the theater. So mm -hmm. let me pull some of them up. Yeah. Um, we see, uh, so during this, like the apartment owner comes or like Stoipa, 
So Stoipa comes, and he's actually the roommate to Berlioz, the guy that lost his head. Stoipa comes back to his apartment with, and there's a seal across the door, and he opens up, goes in there. There's Wolin, Behemoth, um, Kororviev, and Azazello. <laughs> He's like, how the hell did you guys get in here? <laughs> Immediately shuts the door. <laughs> Damn, it's stank in there. It's hot. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, long story short, um, he, like, wants them to get out. And and they needed him to, like, okay these uh, contracts for Wolin to mm -hmm. work there. Yeah. So what we're told as the reader is basically Stoipa encounters them and then – we're told where all of a sudden he's on the other side of Russia and Yalta. Yeah. And he's calling back to the theater and we're introduced to then uh, Grimsky. We're introduced to a few different people that work at the theater and like Yalta, that's over 900 miles away. How'd you get there? And one night you were just here yesterday and they say, remember you came in here, uh, you're rushing in here and saying that we had to sign these contracts for the event tonight. Wolin's seance of black magic. So we see that Wolin used his powers to manipulate Stoipa to go and get these contracts. And this is another theme throughout the book is that Wolin and his crew can fabricate uh, official papers out of mm -hmm. thin air. And this is, again, Bulgakov mocking and criticizing the way that Soviet Union runs is that they don't see people. They see pieces of paper. And there's a comment about how one day you're official and one day you're not. Uh, this is something that Kororbiev, one of the henchmen of Wolin, says, highlighting that the Soviet Union doesn't even see people. It's not even about equal rights. It's such a bureaucratic structure. It's all about these official papers that Wolin can use to manipulate people at, at a whim, because if they have that, then they're safe. It's interesting reading this in hindsight because Yalta, anybody, I mean, I don't know about you guys like in the chat, but Yalta, I immediately think of the Yalta conference, right? So it's like <laughs> his Roosevelt Satan and Stalin is sitting there like a big, you know, like a big cat, right? And Churchill is Azazel. I mean, in a way, that's probably poetically true. <laughs> um, but yeah, with the contracts, it's like there's the there's the issue of there's the contract later, right? And there's the selling of the soul, and then there's the the permission, the permissive aspect of this. Um, but I think that that's pretty strong. Like the, the unpersoning and the undocumenting of people right. um, is certainly, um, and certainly we're seeing this uh, again. That's how the federal government, again, yeah. our, we, we see this bureaucratic structure grow yeah. and the way that it maintains itself is through like these official records. And so yeah. again, Bogakov makes multiple <clears throat> jabs at this throughout the book is that, um, Again, the whole utopian rhetoric of communism never even comes close to being fulfilled in these structures because yeah. of the hierarchical authoritative structure that it has. And money, official paperwork, sex, this is how he, basically you can control the Muscovites is, yes. is how Wolin manipulates. Can you keep going for a second? I just drank three Red Bulls and I'm about to burst. Okay, so so, sure. so give me one second here and DPH is going to take you through, this, through the next part. I'll be right, right. back. So as we just talked about, um, we see that Stoipa, the roommate of, of Bert, uh, Berdlyov, he is sent to the other side. He's calling the theater, this theater where Wolin, Satan, is getting ready to perform this huge black magic seance. And everybody's super excited about it. And all of a sudden, there's advertisements all over Moscow, these posters. Again, nobody knows exactly how they got there, but it's demonstrating Bogakov is highlighting the supernatural abilities of Wolin and his crew. So it leads into my favorite part of the book, which is his black seance, which is chapter 12. Um, and it's the black magic and its exposure. And so in this chapter, um, oh, oh, the professor and the poet. So right before this chapter, we're introduced to the master. Actually, um, so chapter eight and then what is nine? Yeah, Yalta just told you about that. And then... Um, yeah, moving into Ivan splits in two. And so Ivan, there's a whole section right before this black seance, that, which is sort of a, the climax, if you will, of part one of the book. And so Ivan is introduced to the master and he's another person that's wheeled out of the psych ward and he's kind of put next to him and the master eventually get, it gets brought up that he has a manuscript that he was writing in regards to Pontius Pilate. 
Now, Ivan is splitting in two because one of his psyche wants to believe that he's just kind of going crazy and that the sedatives are working and that, again, the rationalistic just structure of the Soviet Union he's going to submit to, lack of courage. And then the other side is that this guy who just got wheeled out next to him in the psych ward actually believes in the same thing, like totally believes wholeheartedly in what he just said about <laughs> Satan and his gang running around Moscow. You saw the tunnels under Denver also, man. <laughs> That's crazy. So, thank you, folks, for uh thank sorry about that. How uncouth. But I just drank two Red Bulls and a and a what and a mimosa drink. So dang anyway, man. sorry about that. <laughs> Thirsty. Yes. Um have we have we gotten to the I, I just got really up basically uh to Ivan and the master was introduced, and I was getting ready to get into chapter 12, my favorite, the seance and the black magic show at the right. theater. Right. Okay. Anything so, you want to say about well, uh, the, all the sections before those? I think we well, did. I just went over through chapters eight through eleven. Well, the, I, I'll say, uh, I'll say about this about the part we're about to cover, which is the the theatrical aspects of this. I think are yeah. important because this is also one of the central scenes in the play. I mean, in the um, novel. Yeah, because I, I it's kind of like the climax of part one. Uh huh. Yeah, we're and we're. Because we have a, a bacchanal that takes place, and it's fitting that it's with the theater. Because number one, we have Behemoth, who is a, a jester character in the kind of court theater of of a pandemonium. There's a pandemonium caused in the theater scene we're about to read, and also that actors are interesting because uh, in any sort of authoritarian regime, I mean. Even even now, right here and now, uh, because uh, they are they are playing roles of other people. So there's a kind of um, suspension of disbelief that occurs in terms of just the theater in general. You you can see people saying things and and ha you know reading lines or you know at the theater with the the black magic guy. And there's this is this fake? Is it not? But we're going to choose to believe it. But what's interesting here is that when they watch. Woland come onto the stage it's like we've all seen you know david copperfield or whatever make the right. you know statue of liberty disappear but you know in the you you want to sort of believe that this happens right but you know that it's just tricks but the tricks here are the trick is the trick right that you're watching the real thing and people can't believe it but it turns into the real thing it turns into a satanic theater and a kind of a kind of like anti-church yeah. where people are free to uh, uh, go after money and, and clamor after things. And there's a, there's a guy on the stage, which is kind of an altar. Um, and, and, you know, I think that this is like a dangerous aspect for, for actors and for theater. And it, certainly theater has always played a part in terms of political, you know, religious and political um especially like pagans, you know, pagan society. And we've talked about this in a bunch of streams, but here it's interesting because, because it also functions on a meta level because Bulgakov is showing that, that in a sense, the, the society within the Soviet society. And now, now this is why it's relevant now is absurd. It's absurd in how theatrical it is. It's like mm -hmm. clown world. It's like watching a carnival. So chapter 12, black magic and its expose. Is that what you want to cover? Yep. Next? So now it shifts to this huge climax. As we said, Woland and his crew is backstage and they're at, again, you can think of a beautiful ornate theater, Soviet union. Everybody's dressed nice and it's men and women, you know, in beautiful dresses and tuxedos. And, um, there's a family act, right? So what opens is like a you know a cyclist and a trapeze artist and this stuff and so it's like an innocuous act right kind of lures mm -hmm. people in it's a family act it's a family so they go off stage and then woland and his crew make their way to the front and i won't say the word but it's actually not even meant in the same way but uh f a double g o t yes uh -huh. is the word that then woland calls out to uh, Koorviev, so one of his henchmen, and I guess the word used in Russian means like bassoon, and so it's uh -huh. like a big kind of flute-looking instrument. And so 
I was trying to figure out what exactly that was about. I, I think it's trying to symbolize like entertainment or something like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, yeah, I'm not sure. So, well, because we're talking about actors. Yeah, right? exactly. And, it's and, entertainment. And, it's, yeah. Well, actors were traditionally um, uh, sex workers. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, of various sorts. And, and, and I don't know about Russian theater, um, but in terms of the English speaking world, I mean, there are no women on stage. Right. It's all men in women's costumes. And so it sort of plays a role in this. Um, so Wolin then um, starts basically telling people uh, that he's going to do black magic and he's going to perform magic. And this all was sort of let off by this MC, which, again, indicative in what Bogakov is trying to criticize is the over rationalism of of the Soviet Union is he's like, we're going to have the, gr the the great and wonderful uh, Woland. And then he is, when he's coming out, he says, but magic isn't real. So he's got to show us how some of these tricks work. And right. this is this idea. And one of the themes is whenever you deny the devil to his face, he's it's like he's able to do something over you. And yes. so uh, he has a sort of power. And so what we see is that first the MC does this, and then he makes a comment about it. And then um, Behemoth, the cat, starts doing a card trick where now he's making entire packs of cards appear in people's pockets. And the person will be surprised and they'll, you know, stand up and they're like, oh, my gosh, how would you do that? But somebody else will say, well, he's a plant. You know, tell us how you did the trick. And then Behemoth would make that person, you know, have a, a, poc a, a pocket full of cards or whatever it was. Right. And then all of a sudden... It, it leads into Wolin making it rain with money and everybody just goes crazy and tries to gather up as much as they can jumping over each other. And um, then he brings out like he, on stage, he opens up like the, this wardrobe and that's where I was talking about the Chanel stuff. It's like the yeah. latest of Paris fashion in 1946. Um, and the women could have access to it, which in Soviet times, you either had to be like a high official or somebody that was allowed to travel internationally to even be aware or have access to these things. Right. So the yeah, women it, are just flooding the stage to get all this stuff. But as the chapter ends and everybody leaves the theater, none of it is real. And there is one point that is very interesting is that um, after the making it rain after the wardrobe, there's a man that stands up and he owns the theater and he's at the top uh -huh. level next to his wife. And he tells him that he needs to be honest with the people and tell them how he did it. And he said, well, why don't you be honest? And he highlights that where were you last night? And his wife yelled, Oh, he was working at the so-and-so commission. And he goes, no, you weren't. You were with that woman over there and names her. And it was his mistress. And, you know, you can hear the gasp of the audience. And so, again, it's the devil that's highlighting who else is lying. Right. right. So it's like this weird play on justice. That's the ambiguity of good and evil that Bokakov keeps playing on. Um, what was the deal with in this chapter? Um, tear off his head. Now, that's an idea, behemoth. Right. And there's another tearing off of a head. Um the cat's black fur stood on end and he let out a spine tingling meow. Then he shrunk into a ball and like a panther lunged straight at Bengalski's chest and from there leapt onto his head. This is Poe, by the way. This is like, this is exactly what happens in Poe's The Black Cat. They unearth a wall and there's a, a cat on top of a man's, uh, de you know, decomposed corpse. Mm -hmm. Um and with a low growl, the cat struck his chubby paws into the MC's greasy hair and with a savage howl, tore the head off on the thick neck in two twists. Oh, that's is, right. Yep. Which is part this is of the MC. It. This is the right. MC. Which is part of the the Bacchanal. Right now we have bloodshed, um, right. blood and money. And stop torturing him, for God's sake, shouted a woman. Thank you. Um, in the loge, the magician turned in her direction and then... They say, now that we've gotten rid of that boar, let's open up a store for the ladies. That's when they open the open up the store because they gotten rid of someone boring, right? Now we have to get rid of the commonplace things and the, and the people having any objections. We need more, more uh, bacchanalia. Um, and then at the end of this chapter, <laughs> the guy says, but I don't understand what this has to do with magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's why he gets exposed. And right. so the uh, Bukowski, the guy, the MC, 
So he gets his head taken off. It horrifies the audience. Then Behemoth puts it back on his body and sends him out in the back. And he's like, he's on his way to the, the hospital. And apparently he lives, but again, highlighting. So imagine again, seeing that making it rain, the dresses appear. Um, and then this guy gets called out. This, this reminds me of, first of all, they do this in, in movies. They do this in the Tim Burton Batman movie, The Joker. You know, Jack Nicholson's Joker does this. He makes it rain on the city, and they start going crazy searching for money. Wesley Snipes does this in uh, New Jack City. Um, oftentimes, there's a Luciferian character. You know, the, the, the uber villain will do this um, to, like, sort of cause pandemonium and chaos in the city. And chaos is mentioned throughout this, you know, causing chaos and, yeah. you know, instability. Um and also the fact that the the magic show, you know, again, in this prestige analysis I did and in Houdini, it's like when you go to the magic show, there's this underlying thing where if we're talking about just stage magic, where oftentimes the characters are mimicking religion in the sense that they are being born again or they're cheating death or they're faking death. And Houdini did this with his drowning. Um, David, uh, what's the name of the of Leo's friend um, who, who – I'm going to, I'm going to freeze myself in a block of ice for 25 days over London. <laughs> yeah, what's that guy's name? The guy who pulls. Oh, uh, out David his, Blaine. Yeah. David Blaine. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he goes, I'm in, I'm in the lower East side. Now I'm going to pull needles out of my neck. Right. And people, it's like they're <laughs> superhuman character. Um, but that becomes melded with, you know, K magic here with like uh, occult magic because we, we literally have the high priest uh, of black magic do, you know, running the ceremony himself. Um, right. And that's supposed to be a counterpoint in the book and this dualistic thing to uh, this dualistic sort of paradigm of they talk, you know, Christ is mentioned as the high priest of Judea, you know, he's the, so there are sort of two high priests mentioned, not that they're opposites, but in terms of the dualistic, you know, ideas uh, within the book. And, Yes, and Christ is clearly demonstrated, at least subtly. Like I said, it's not exactly Christian, but he is the truth. The goal is to speak truth, and his authority is a totally different kind of authority. And for Bogakov, the biggest thing is it's tied to courage. So that's yeah. so that's like the moral message is it, that's where it's it's ambiguity it, ambiguous it has ambiguity. Because it's ambiguous. There we go. Because um, he's always using these like both hand situations, like the main love affair being an, you know, adultery by both people. Yeah. Um, so the other the other thing is <clears throat> that <clears throat> so much is, of the book is taken up with larger than life characters, some of whom even become more than human or become you know animals, and bold actions and bold statements. And you you can't help but notice somewhere along your reading that the ab not not really the absence of Christ within it's certainly the absence of Christ when you're talking about when they're doing the satanic ball and all this stuff you're you're purely in Satan territory here but what you notice is that is blessed are the meek right they shall inherit the earth it, and that's sort of the commentary that he's making is that um, the 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 silences and the meekness of christ is is the is it has a validity and a and yeah. a potency and a power that no matter what these other characters do they can't overrein the power of christ um, right and and it's a moral thing because obviously he does insinuate that he dies on the cross so it's that there's no fear because there's multiple points in which what the wallen says he does is he uses their own rationality yeah. to make them fearful in which he then can manipulate them. He either appeals to one of the, again, I know we're orthodox, but one of the takes could be like the seven deadly sins. Obviously there's more than seven. I get it. Uh -huh. But uh, he, he uses these as wheels in which people construct rational frameworks where that's all they think about is their self-interest rationally. <clears throat> and then through that or fear through these tricks that they do. So in multiple instances, like people who come to the apartment specifically, typically are presented with Wolin and they do something that's just shocking to them. And they're, you know, or attack, you know, one guy's stumbling down the stairs trying to get away. The guy who actually owns the apartment building. Um, uh, OCD sidetrack here for the people in the chat. 
Do you want to know how to mnemonic device to, to remember the seven deadly sins? I learned this in 10th grade studying the okay. fairy queen by Edmund Spencer. Slaw peg. Slaw peg. Lust, avarice, wrath, pride, envy, gluttony. There's your mnemonic device to remember the seven deadly sins, which is from. Say that one more from, time. Uh, slaw peg. Sloth, lust, avarice, wrath, pride, envy, gluttony. Slaw peg. All yeah, right. Yeah. My, my I'll put that one in my me. back pocket. I appreciate Shouts out that. to Mr. Wood. You got to remember this. You got to remember this. <laughs> Memorize it before tomorrow. It's a test grade. <laughs> so I guess I passed that one because I still got it. Um, but uh, the next chapter, the next chapter goes in. Please support people. Please um, share the yeah, stream. Send like, and super chat, that support. People. Yeah. If you got questions, Right. If you got questions for uh, DPH here, Church of the Eternal Logos, put them, put them, put them in a uh, super chat. Right. You can super chat. You can send a donut, and you can send uh, uh, various things. And yeah, uh, we will get to those. BLA. We're gonna have a big. We're at uh, almost twenty, almost at twenty eight hundred subs here. I think when we get to three thousand, we're gonna have a big uh, party. Okay, so uh, please uh, help me get those subs in, you guys. Um, next chapter goes into uh, Enter the Hero. So finally we get the master. <laughs> comes into the yeah. book after the 12th. It's fitting that he comes in after the 12th chapter because 12 is the traditional number in, in English literature. Um, yeah. Well, in, in Greek and Roman literature as well. Yeah, this, um, is, this is actually the chapter, not, uh, not 9 and 9, 10, or 11, that... Right. Uh, highlights the master, then begins to talk about his Pontius Pilate work. Yeah, so twelve is the traditional book of the of the epic. We we have uh, twelve chapters or twelve books in an epic, um, and so now we get into the thirteenth chapter here and enter the hero. The master comes in, and um, and we get discussion of Pushkin. Uh, like you said, Pontius Pilate. Um, there's uh, mention of Faust specifically here. Uh, I wrote that. This is where the confirmation, as if you needed one before, it's a confirmation that Woland is Satan. The meeting confirms that the man yeah. arguing atheistic evolutionary apologetics admits that he is ignorant in this part. Yes. Um, I, Ivan admits because the he's fascinated the fact that the master is like not even blinking at the story. And he's like, oh, yeah, that that professor, you know, you know, yes. that's Satan, right? <laughs> he's like, I'm surprised you didn't know that. Yeah, you're not catching on. And right. so Ivan's like, what? Whoa, man. <laughs> he becomes Charles Manson. <laughs> Jesus and Lucifer on the same side of things. Um, so, That's kind of what Bogokov insinuates. Right. He does, yes. And, and we get on page 114 in this book, in this same chapter, um, Enter the Hero. The guest face darkened and he shook his fist at Ivan. And then he said, I am the master. That's his name here. We learn later why he's called the master. Um, and he became stern, reached into his pocket in his robe and took out a grimy black cap that had the letter M embroidered on it in yellow silk. Again, like you said, the opposite yep. of Woland here with the W. What's your name? I no longer have a name. The strange guest replied with a gloomy disdain. I gave it up just as I've given up everything else in life. Let's drop the subject. He knows five languages uh, besides my own English, French, German, Latin, Greek. Um, and I think that's interesting because, again, we have a sort of ego death here and an absence. When one loses one's name, it's a tr it's truly the, the sign of the ego death. They've lost their identity, right? right? Christ says, you know, I mean, you, you're, you, you are uh, baptized. You get your name. Christ knows your name. And here he has lost his name and burned his book, right? right. So he is he's sort of floating in this obliter obliter obliterating like and, formless and magic, void. right? So that the whole mm -hmm. book, like the Key of Solomon, is about the naming of the demons so mm -hmm. you can have power over them. And Woland doesn't really have power over the master, right? The whole right. premise is that he only engages with Woland really once Margarita has made this blood covenant with, with Satan. Yeah. To yeah. like have eternal peace with the master. It's, so, it's, it's just so funny to me how <laughs> she's presented with this contract and she's like, I'm in, <laughs> I'm all in. Right. <laughs> she's very quick. There's not really much that's, it's interesting because the book's tempo has a, a speed to it. We're, we're kind of going through the parts where we have a stillness and a, and a slowness are obviously the, the parts about the passion and, you know, uh, and the time of Christ. 
But here, immediately after the crucifixion, we get, you know, a speed that starts like as if we're rushing toward an end. And actually that occurs um, in this chapter because the master says about his book yes. what his end would be. Um, and I think this is this is emblematic of the writer himself because oftentimes writers will know the eventual end to which they're running. They'll know the last line or they'll know the title or they'll know the words at the beginning, um, but they need to fill it in with the space of actually putting pen to paper. And here right. he says, uh, white cloak, blood red lining. I understand, exclaimed Ivan. Exactly. Pilot was flying to an end, an end. And I already knew that the last words of the novel would be, quote, the fifth procurator of Judea, the night Pontius Pilate, end quote. And that's exactly what occurs in the book that is the end of the book um and then we also have gazing at the moon uh she was carrying some hideous yet disturbing yellow flowers the devil only knows what they're called for some reason they're the first ones to bloom in moscow and those flowers stood out very distinctly against her black spring coat and she was carrying yellow flowers a bad color so there's the, there's part of our answer for the sunflower at the beginning right that's right? exactly i tied that yeah. back to yeah. that and this is the first time we're hearing about Margarita, although the reader doesn't know yet it's technically Margarita. All you mm -hmm. know is it's a woman that the master, this guy in the psych ward, who's talking with Ivan and knows all about the Professor Wolin, uh, he's telling about this girl he fell in love with. This this um, chapter contains what I think is, I think this is the most striking phrase in the whole book. Yeah, I was going to say, um, this was the one with the quote well, what he used to me. Yeah, what he says here is, uh, on page 116 of this book, he says, Go on, said Ivan, please don't leave anything out. Go on, the gas echoed. Well, you yourself can guess what happened next. Suddenly he wiped away an unexpected tear with his right sleeve and continued. Here's the quote I love. Just like a murderer jumps out of nowhere in an alley, love jumped out in front of us and struck us both at once. The way lightning strikes or a Finnish knife. She, by the way, would later say that it wasn't like that that we had of course loved each other for a very long time without knowing or ever having seen each other and that she was living with another man. And I was then with that. What's her name? It's a, it's a, that's a beautiful phrase. You know, it's yeah. so it, and that speaks to the whole work because it's filled with this kind of invisible violence that you're trying to find the words for. And that love jumps out like a murderer or a Finnish knife. You imagine the, the, the sheen of the knife in the moonlight, right? Or like, because it's cutting, it's cutting them. It's cut them apart, mm -hmm. right? And it's it's cutting their lives and it's drawing blood. There's a lot of blood drawing in this. Um, and they're, like you said, both married. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's hurting other people too. The lightning strike also, of course, plays a role um, after the cruise, you know, at the time of the crucifixion, lightning strikes, um, and there's there's continuous imagery of like inky blackness and darkness that usually occurs. It's interesting because that's like the the black goo sort of appears um, as a pr primordial chaos when we see Woland appear at times like we're walking into a dream state. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, let's see. Oh, I wrote on page 118, the first thing she does is cook. Um, <laughs> they got together, they met, and then she went back to the house and started cooking for him. Yeah. Right? I mean, she she's a good little helper. She cooks, yeah. she feeds him, she takes care of him. Turns out he's an, he's an older man. She's all about it. Um, She definitely loves him. Right. Um, so the next, do you want to get into the next chapter? No, you, you, yeah, you keep going. Yeah. Okay. So uh, chapter 14 called Glory to the Cock is about um rimsky so excuse me mine says praise be to the rooster okay <laughs> does it really <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah but it's the cock crowing right yeah interesting that interesting that um that this is the penguin classic translation it's, it's interesting that you know i always found this funny that the symbol for france is the gallic cock right it's the rooster and Gaul, the Gaul means rooster in France, but Gaul is how we think of France. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, this one is about, okay, let me introduce this character, Rimsky. He's the treasurer of the Variety Theater, where this mm -hmm. seance just happened. 
Rimsky is the only character to escape from an attack by Woolen's entourage, which we're getting ready to describe, despite trying to find logical explanations for an odd phenomenon. So we see this pattern again. He realizes that Veronica, another guy that works at the theater, is lying to him when he outlines a seemingly reasonable explanation for where Stoipa, the guy sent to the other side of Russia, Yalta, went and correctly identifies that Veronica has no shadow. He's a vampire yeah. because he yeah. was, he interacted and was, uh, it was bitten or kissed. I don't know. Uh, it's Hella. It's a naked woman who apparently has a fantastic body, but she smells terrible of the undead. Um, and she's basically a vampire. She's a succubus. It's specifically described she's a succubus. Right. The dead girl stepped onto the window still, and Rimsky could clearly see patches of decay on her breast. <laughs> he doesn't cast a shadow, cried Rimsky. <laughs> <laughs> and so why it's praise to the rooster is because Veronica, assaulted by Hella, he is getting ready to... so. The way it worked out is Rimsky's in this office. Veronica comes in covering his face, and and uh, Rimsky's like, well, "What's going on with you?" Well, he gets terrified and he rings a bell, mm -hmm. a bell to try to like go get official help, like again, like the the Soviet police, and that annoys Veronica, who then like locks the probably door. probably annoys the police too. They keep hearing a <laughs> ringy dingy, right? <laughs> so he um, locks the door. And is then revealing to Rimsky that basically, again, he has no shadow. He's a vampire. And then here comes Hella, the naked chick that's dead. And um, the cock crows. And because right. of that, it symbolized that the sun was getting ready to rise. So, again, one of the only other solar symbols here. And because the sun was getting re ready to rise, they had to leave. Hmm. So it highlights that at least these characters are somehow tied with like nighttime nocturnal activity where Woland again the whole thing in Patriarch Pond happened in the morning. So Behemoth, uh Kirorviev, Azazello, and Woland, they seem to be able to present themselves whenever they want. But this chapter would insinuate that some of these other creatures, like the ones that are vampires, Veronica and Hella, they're limited by only being out during the nighttime. Yeah, this is the opposite of that classic book Twilight, right? Where she says, well, I thought you couldn't go out in the sunlight. And he says, no, you have it wrong about vampires. It's, we can't go out in the, in the light. It's not because it'll burn us, but because we shine like diamonds in the sun, <laughs> right? which, is, which is actually a Luciferian, right? Like shining like diamonds, uh, like bright diamonds. Right. Um, or, and also this ties back to the beginning of, of the novel because of the betrayal, right? It, it ties in with the betrayal and the cock crowing. Yeah. Um, and so the light is coming. Yeah, which was um, we and we didn't mention that, but that was part of chapter two there with Pilot. Right. The cock crowed when basically Pilot kind of knew that he's going to make the cowardice decision. Yes, and um, and again, uh, this character appears in the moonlight, always moonlight, right? Um, and then at the end of this chapter. Yeah, the rooster crowed again. The girl grated her teeth. There's a constant net. It's interesting how um, Bulgakov is brilliant at infusing heavily symbolic and allegorical language in with colloquialisms. So it's just common speech. And he says things like the girl, crow, uh, the, the rooster crowed again. The girl grated her teeth and her red hair stood on end. Well, she has red hair and she's grating her teeth, but there's a gnashing of teeth. I kept thinking of the, the chicken X-Men. Doesn't she have red hair? Yeah. And she's in like mm -hmm. a blue bodysuit. Yeah. I think of <laughs> I think of that's one of the things I gotta say about the book. And our translations are obviously different, but there's like a movie and it has a bad like voiceover. Uh, uh -huh. but I didn't even want to watch it because I have such great mental images from reading the book. Yeah. That I really just want to just keep the way that I see it in my head. I didn't watch any of the films or film stage productions because because the it's kind it's a pretty unfilmable book um which is strange because so much of the imagery is so concrete and we go from place to place and we're we're in set scenes but it's unfilmable in terms of being able to translate the brilliant language into imagery on a screen it it yeah it like how would you do behemoth without it being like 
comical and it's not right. comical. It's like he like keeps people on their toes because he does one imagine that you see a cat acting human and can talk. But then he's like shooting guns. He's yeah. drinking uh, cognac, <laughs> like he's eating mushrooms. Right. Yeah, it's kind of like it's a bad trip, man. Am I saying <laughs> those things or just thinking them? Right? And there's a cat. Um, so it's it's like a it's supposed to be the way that I guess Loki is right in pagan mythology. It's like it's he's a trickster, but the trick can be played on you. And at the end, they make a point about m mice, and it seems like again because they get to choose they have different appearances his crew his entourage depending on where they go and what time period they're in obviously so they've made themselves to appear as foreigners only in the moscow context uh. but it's like a ma cat and mouse game right so he's the cat they're the mice and he's playing with them and he's the ultimate trickster he's the one that plays with them well, like I said, you know, whether they've been naughty or mice. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. There's the bell. There's the next uh, chapter, Nikonor uh, Ivanovich's dream, which contains, I wrote at the top of this page, gang stalking, blackmail, intimidation, and ritual humiliation. Oh, well, let's explain uh, Nikonor Ivanovich because we haven't mm -hmm. even brought him in as a character yet. And so <clears throat> Nikonor Ivanovich, let me see if I have the exact description. He, oh, here we go. Uh, Bosoy, he's the chairman of the House Committee. And um, he, unlike regular Moscow citizens who often live in communal apartments, thanks to his status, Bosoy is able to live in a single apartment with his wife. When talking to Korviev, Bosoy accepts a bribe. For his greed and trickery, he is deceived by Korviev. And later gets arrested in a hint that Balsoy keeps foreign currency at his home, which then was strictly prohibited. The bribe from Korbiev turned into foreign money. And so this guy also ends up in the psych ward because they're trying to figure out. He, he goes to the apartment and makes a deal with Korbiev. Again, what, one of the four guys that are kind of always around or with Roland and... Um, he has, I think he gives him, I forget how much it was, like 10,000 rubles or something like that. Yeah. Well, he goes and stuffs the money in a vent in his apartment. And as it happens every time, all the money that they use for magic always turns into insignificant items or foreign currency that's going to get mm -hmm. them in trouble. And so it turns into, I forget which currency. One of them turns into U.S. dollars. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's the woman underneath the apartment at the end with the... Uh, the bedazzled horseshoe. What am I going to do with this? Buy some bedazzlers in America? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Kristen says, as a TI, I would love to hear about the gang stalking. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to get to it. So Ivanovich gets arrested and then eventually gets transported. And that's where this uh, Nikonor Ivanovich's his dream, this chapter mm. 15. That's what this is about, is now he's in front of Professor Stravinsky, the head psychiatrist at this psych ward and he's also they've sedated this dude too and so yeah. <laughs> now he's having like these fantasy dreams um why did i write this um this part uh I agree with you completely said the actor firmly and I ask you what sorts of things are planted on people so we're talking about blackmail operations here a baby shouted someone from the floor absolutely right Anonymous letters, proclamations, time bombs, and a lot of other things, but four hundred dollars isn't one of them because nobody's that stupid. But we're talking about plant, you know, that's what that's the what we were just discussing. Mm -hmm. Um oh and, and go ahead. I was gonna this is a bit of a chain tangent, but I won't take it too far away. But I saw uh, somebody just mentioned Lucifer in the chat and may reminded me of a point I wanted to make earlier is that also uh sometimes Satan is depicted with knee injuries from his fall. As mm. Lucifer, mm. so right. when Wolin has a knee problem, also it's going to make it hard for him to kneel before God. Right. I thought that was a great point. But then sometimes in art, he's depicted with like a wounded knees or a wounded knee from his fall. All right. the 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 bodily imagery is is continuous in this um, injuries in the side, 
left hand path, left left hand and right hand heterochromia in the eyes, wounded knees. I mean, it's 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 very it's it's amazing to me how he because the great works of literature are often you know they they have to do this where they when you bring in and especially if it's in verse, if you use a word or a, a word that seems out of place in the text, it has to match the other words thematically in order to process the theme. Right. And so nothing is like, although it seems that there's a lot of extraneous imagery and characterization in this, it's all for a point. P part of the reason that he has so many characters named is and, and talked about is because he's giving an all encompassing uh, narrative depiction of society as a whole. He goes right. through every level of society. He talks about everyone's archetypes and the quintessence of each pe each person and each job because he's presenting this huge satire of Soviet society, which is, which is not dated. You know, it's just right. transferred. That's it's the just thing. transferred it's to book. here. It's yeah. had a total transference and, transference. and that's why it's, the book continues to be relevant and why it's, I think it, it has such power. I agree. Um, chapter 16. Uh, oh, oh, at the oh, end yeah, of the execution of Christ. Yeah. At the end of chapter 15 though, after he gets in the, it gets the injection. There's a, an interesting part. He says, um, because this is a morphine description. He says, but right. the doctor quickly calmed all his distraught and afflicted patients and they began to doze off. This is like, uh, I mean, this is almost like, uh, um, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Did in a, a right. we did a, a literary analysis of that. Oblivion, oblivion, came to Ivan last of all, just as dawn was breaking over the river. After the medicine had filtered through his entire body, peace and calm engulfed him like a wave. His body felt lighter, just like the witch. Yep. And the warm breeze of sleep caressed his head. Again, this this, you know, um, this sort of uh, out of body experience of the head, but feeling the head on the body here, but in oblivion, his last thing he heard before he fell asleep was the pre-dawn twittering of the birds in the wood, but they soon fell silent. And he began to dream that the sun was already sinking behind bald mountain. And the mountain was encircled by double cordon. And then that is repeated in the beginning of the next chapter, which, which is verse like, this is almost like Walt Whitman or something where we have, as prose, but we have almost long lines of prose poetry showing this continuation. It's like a, we just, uh, he just right. mentioned a wave. It's like we have a wave and the repetition of it takes us on. It's a fluidity that takes us on to the next chapter. Yeah, and um, it, this and, one, it, the last sentence begins. Yes. Oh no, no, no. Yeah. yeah the last sentence begins the, the, sentence the, the, next the, sentence of the next chapter. Yeah. yeah which that occurs happens a, a couple times in the book. Mm -hmm. And it happens when it connects Pontius Pilate to something that's happening because this whole thing, Pontius Pilate is in one day, but Moscow is a couple of days, at least the scene. Yes. And, because and the, there's time dilation and time distortion. Even when they go on the ride later, it's like dawn, you know, nighttime lasts longer than it does in human hours. It's like right. there's a the time gets skewed in this surrealistic sort of atmosphere. But yeah, the way the wave of the dream takes us into the past, and now we're back at the execution and the and the time of Christ. Right. And so we, as you said earlier, this one talks about Rat Slayer and how mm -hmm. he's basically like the harden of the hard, and um, yes. everybody else is beat down by the heat, and it could even affect him at all. And it, this is where, again, it gets up to, um, and at one point, again, this is one of the mischaracterizations that is not theologically accurate, but one of, at one point, um, he insinuates that Matthew Levi wanted to kill Christ to prevent his suffering. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so it, you ask, well, why would Volkov do that? And I thought about it myself, and I think he's trying to highlight that the suffering and it is beneficial that the resurrection somehow has a real influence and that again it's this it's this strange dichotomy between that being incredibly beneficial and pilot being a coward and so he makes the pilot makes the wrong decision but at the same time it's the suffering is beneficial for like the fuller m mission of Christ uh, it, now it's this isn't explicated in the book but you you're trying to figure out why all this stuff is laid out the way it is. So 
here we see Matthew Levi again, um, you know, hides on the steep side of the mountain. Um, he saw that uh, Yeshua, they would con continue to refer to Christ as Yeshua. Again, he's trying to use the Aramaic. And Matthew Levi cuts him down. So Christ is already crucified and he cuts him down off the cross and shows that he's a devoted follower and that he loves Jesus and that he takes care of him and he like cleans the body and takes him to be buried. I'm trying to find the part where Christ says the thing about, about rat killer in the beginning here. Um, Cause he said, what about Centurion Mark whom they call rat killer? Is he a good man? Yes, he is answered the prisoner, but yeah, here it is. But he's an unhappy man. Ever since good people disfigured him, he's been cruel and hard. I'm curious to know who, who mutilated him, which is powerful to me um, because it, it's showing Christ's grace, right? Yeah. That that the guy is doing these things, but he wants peace, and there's a reason for this, right? And that he, even he is the hardest man in the Roman Empire um, who's you know head and shoulders above everybody else physically – uh, can be brought low, um, but it's probably low within himself. And right. I, I, th I was thinking about the Matthew thing because there's a scene where Matthew uh, is, you know, is talking to, to Pontius Pilate and he says something like, I'm going to kill that man, Judas, and there's nothing anybody can do to stop me. Yeah. Right. And Except I think, I think what he's saying there is that maybe he's, I don't know, maybe he's tapping into the fact that Matthew is human and that we're human and, what they did to Christ um, makes you makes you at, at first it can make one it make it makes me feel vengeful it makes me feel angry right that they right. Would, that they that they do this right and right. that's not what ends up that's not how it ends up and like you said it's not accurate yeah but I think I, maybe he's maybe he's playing into this um, in I terms think of it's a, the duality of good and evil because. Mm -hmm. 16 ends by Matthew cursing God for being evil, for killing yeah. Jesus, for right. allowing these, these, the sufferings that happen to Jesus, which again, isn't accurate. It's not theologically correct, but that's where this whole book that Bulgakov is trying to build is this ambiguity and where the line is, because if Christ is who he is, it was wrong for Pilate to do what he did. If Christ is who he is, then him suffering and dying is, beneficial for many um but then if god the father is who he is why would he let the suffering happen to jesus which is unjust uh -huh. now yeah. again it's not a true it's not a solid theological but that's the framework that you get it if you're trying to follow the theology there yeah it's also and it's also the book within the book right so we're 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 reading this from the reader's perspective from listening to the story from reading the book there are layers here that it's being filtered through um shouts out to amp down for being new hey, member there yeah amp you can grab down. memberships there everybody can grab a membership i've done three uh membership streams just for the members i did um somebody brought up had i seen the killer uh recently which is the um david fincher movie we did an analysis on that we did um uh silent night deadly night which is the antithesis to home alone that we did uh on your channel it's oh, the nice. absolute exact opposite of that movie um and is it actually is actually a really well done movie in terms of being a uh, a b movie slasher film but is really the antithesis to that it's a it's a pretty insightful look into the serial killer um which is very weird um 1984 movie uh we also did the tom coon movie uh the new mission impossible and there's more of those to come so thank you amtown appreciate it yeah, he says uh, a single a single instant would be enough to plunge a knife into Yeshua's back and shout, Yeshua, I'm saving you and I'm going with you. I, Matthew, your true and only disciple. And then there's a part at the end here. Again, there's growling. There's growling. Something took hold of it with his teeth. And then dusk had fallen and lightning ripped through the black sky. Suddenly there was a burst of fire and the centurion shout, break ranks. It was drowned out by the thunder. The happy soldiers ran off down the hill, putting on their helmets. So this is the moment of, of crucifixion. Mm -hmm. and, and then um, the next chapter we we move back to moscow uh -huh. is this chapter uh Seven, 17 on upsetting yeah, chapter day? 17 yeah. the unquiet day yeah. and so um 
this is the Friday morning. So we just had this black seance magic day in Moscow on a Thursday. And now this is Friday morning. There is a huge queue outside the Variety Theater waiting for the tickets for Wollin's next performance that evening. I can't uh, wait to see Taylor Swift tonight. There's 50,000 <laughs> people outside. of the Have you seen that? I mean, look, Taylor Swift sells out a 75,000 person, you know, seat uh, stadium every night. But there's like 50,000 people outside who can't even get tickets who are there to watch her on, right. on the Jumbotrons. Uh, but yeah, it, they're queued up on the outside. And so um, now we have we're introduced to uh, a new character because he is the highest ranking member in the theater now. It is uh, this is last Vasily Vasily yeah. uh, Vasily Stepanovich Last Tochkin. It says here. yes. I'm trying to find him on my list of characters. Oh, there he is. So he's the bookkeeper of the Variety Theater. But wow. because, remember, uh, Stopoy, or Stoipa, uh, the roommate of Berlioz, he's in Yalta. Um, Veronushka is a vampire. And Rimsky, the guy that almost got bit by Veronushka and Hella in the office, he, freak, he freaked out and he got a train like over to Leningrad. He got out of Moscow as soon as he could. Yeah. And so he's not there anymore. And now they have this huge event for Wolin getting ready to come and uh he finds himself to be the head in charge and so he's just the bookkeeper uh described by Bulgakov as precise and efficient Lasso Chicken is also present at Wolin's seance and is left to make sense of the event's aftermath for the police as the theater's most senior remaining member after being questioned by the police Lasso Chick Chicken um heads to the commission of spectacles and entertainment of the lighter type and this is again um Bulgakov's trying to make a comment on the mundanity of the bureaucratic offices of the Soviet Union so this is the office for entertainment and yeah. its name is the commission on spectacles and entertainment of the lighter type to explain that the prior day events but is greeted by pandemonium as the chairman has been turned into a talking suit. So he's taking the money, right, that they just made that night from his black seance. He's the highest one in charge now. He's the he's the bookkeeper. Doesn't have no business doing it, but he's taking all the money to the event to process it. Literally Turn pandemonium. Literally, yeah. all the demons, right? All the demons. And you hear that like they they can't stop singing patriotic songs despite like on their face. They you can tell they don't want to. And this is highlighting, again, the forced patriotism within the Soviet Union. So um, he goes to this office and pandemonium's breaking out. And the guy who's supposed to be head of this office is he has no body there. It's just a suit. And the women see this and they're screaming. And so unable to file his report there, uh, again, of what happened the night before, uh, Lazzo Chicken continues on his way to the commission affiliate where he encounters further havoc as the staff has been forced to sing uncontrollably. His final stop of the day takes him to the bank to deposit the variety's earnings from Wollin's performance. There, upon discovering that all his fares have turned into thousands of foreign currencies, Lazzo Chicken is then promptly and ceremoniously arrested. This is like uh, when Led Zeppelin played Madison Square Garden and they earned a uh, hundred, like a hundred, I think it was one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars for the concert. And the next day, Peter Grant, the manager, went to uh, the safety deposit box and it was empty. It was broken into, and they said, "Oh, it was the mob. Maybe it was uh, in league with him, but the money was gone, or money maybe it was laundering." But it's also this also speaks to the fact that one thing that's noticeable in this book is that everyone, when when they live in an authoritarian. Uh, Stalinist regime, everyone at least at the very least is aware of the rules, the regiments and the and the censorship. They're aware of what they have to do and what they must do, what they can't do. Right. Whereas you read this now and you go, if this is here, th it's all nebulous. The same rules occur, but probably worse. But no one knows. And it's all no one knows anything. So everyone's sort of kept in the dark. No, there's no list. Right. And and I think Crispy's right on the talking suit. That's the symbolism I took from it is that even though he's there's no there there anymore, like he's not even there, he's still 
is trying to do his office duties. Mm. It's the emptiness of the suit. It's the emptiness mm. of these official positions. It's the emptiness of the people that just do go along to get along. Right. Um, yeah. Anna, Anna Ricard, uh, Ricardovna appears. Just imagine I was sitting here. Began Anna Ricardovna trembling with agitation and once again grabbing the bookkeeper by his sleeve and in walks a black cat black big as a hippopotamus right literally a behemoth i naturally uh, scream scat he takes off and a fat man with a kind of cat-like mug comes on instead he says to me are you the one who screams scat to visitors <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um and then later on of course um Hey, the in in italics in this book. Uh, hey, northeast wind, roll out the breakers, and that's again part of this web of words because because we constantly see demons of the air. Um, I know that, uh, like for instance, Paymon is like a demon of the northwest wind, right? So we cut, and then they they fly. They literally fly, and the witches fly. Shouts out to Luchador seventeen sixty four who says based. Do your rendition of the classic weird Satanist guy video, please. <laughs> What's, oh, is that the guy that was on Geraldo? Well, which, which, oh, oh, that guy. Um, so, so we were playing around. I'm a necromancer. <laughs> so we found a headless body and uh, I'm a necromancer mage. And that particular ritual takes a lot of glitter. So they said that we ruined the crime scene. <laughs> <laughs> which is a real which is a real interview thank you luchador <laughs> these these guys like larping in the woods found a headless body and he said i'm a necromancing mage so they tried to they tried to save the guy the cops came and they'd, they'd sprinkled glitter on the body oh my god it's not funny but it is all right that's terrible though rest in peace you know Jeez. um yeah, so <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm a necro. So we 18 is the last chapter of book one. Mm -hmm. And I'm having let me look. I forget what happened in here. Let me uh look. Behemoth and Azazel appear in the narrative again. Um he bellowed through the door. Azazel oh, this is where early off uncle comes. Uh -huh. So this is where this is the last chapter of book one, and we see another empty person. Yeah, and uh, Maximilian Andreevich Papalovsky, um, <laughs> he comes from Kiev to Moscow. Um, un didn't even it just by happen chance that Berlioz's funeral is going to happen. Yeah, and he uh, comes to Moscow as we said to look at his apartment, and he also then sort of breaks into it. It uh, appears to be sealed, even though we know people had gone out with it. So, but, so that's another instance of like the supernatural abilities of Wolin and his crew. And he goes in there and he totally gets played with and manipulated. And he gets attacked by a behemoth, I believe. And he falls down the stairs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. He walks in and, uh, Behemoth admits to tell, uh, sending the, the telegram and asks, what of it? Pavlovsky can't believe he's talking to a cat. So imagine he walks into this room that's supposed to be his dead nephew's apartment in Moscow that he wants to get before anybody gets it. And, the, and what they're showing is that in Soviet Union, you actually didn't own anything. And so these right. apartments were highly prized and you just had to get the official document changed to your name. And it was yours because you had the official paperwork. And that's what he's trying to do is rush there to, to get the paperwork to put it in his name. And so uh, he can't believe he's talking to a cat. And he says, I believe I asked in good Russian. Um, and so you can imagine this. I don't know. In my head, it does. I don't know if it described him as portly, but I imagine this old man like walking up the stairs dressed nicely and walking into this room. And he has a talking cat that tells him he sent the letter in Russian. <laughs> I imagine Carl Schwab coming in and saying, mm, this is good. You will own nothing and like it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The short little man who scared Pavlovsky to death with his fang, his knife and his cataract only came up to the economist's shoulders, but his actions were smooth, efficient and forceful. Um, oh, it's Azazello that promptly whacks Pavlovsky mm -hmm. uh, with a, a huge roast chicken. 
Yes. Yeah, because he carries a chicken bone instead of a instead of a um uh what do you call it? Like a pin? No, instead of a um a handkerchief in his oh. in his oh, in his yeah. uh, breast coat pocket, he carries a chicken bone sticking. So he's got this fang, right? Uh, heterochromatic eyes. He's short, red-haired man. He's hellish. Bowler Azazel cap. Is. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then a chicken bone sticking out. And and Azazel. Azazello will function again as the as the enforcer in this who's yeah. quick in action. He says very little in the book, but he's but he's quick in action. And actually, Azazello um is the is the one of the scenes is the only time chapter 30 is um someone tries to make the sign of the cross, and uh it's the only direct clash of the satanic with the Christian in the book. Um, because Ooh. Azazello quickly jumps on him. Um, it won't let it make the sign. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of this ch chapter, we also it, have. Uh, well, I was going to say that this is where the barkeeper comes to the uh -huh, barman yes. from the variety, Andre Fokic Sokov. And yes. he basically goes in there, gets tempted with everything. He doesn't make that much money. He passes all the tests. He recognizes it's Satan. And he gets told that he's going to have liver cancer in nine months. Right. And he actually, according to the epilogue, dies from liver cancer nine months later. It's like, we, man, this guy got the wrong end of the deal here. Well, we get this passage. There's also owl symbolism in this part. Um, but we get this passage. Uh, and I wouldn't advise you to go to the clinic either. What point is there in dying in a ward, listening to the moans and rasps of the terminally ill? Wouldn't it be better to spend the 27000 on a banquet after taking poison, depart for the other world to the sound of violence, surrounded by intoxicated, beautiful women and dashing friends? Which is like, sounds like an eyes wide shut ritual. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, the bartender says, leave me alone for Christ's sake. Go to hell, you old skin flint. Um, and at the, later on, at that very moment, the beret meowed and turned into a black kitten, which then leapt back onto Andre Fa uh, Fakich's head and dug its claws into his right. bald spot. And you see, he's one of the few characters that cried out to Christ and not yes. the devil. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just going to say, at the end of the, the last part of the chapter, because it always leads, it's like in verse, like at the in a line break or a stanza break, you know, leading into this other world, which is the next chapter in this. And he says, we have no idea whether there are any strange occurrences in Moscow that night. We have no intention of trying to find out since the time has come for us to proceed to part two of this true narrative. Follow me reader. Here's a, a an interesting second person direct address to the reader. Right. Which, which is the, I think the only time in the book where we get that. And then we go into part two, which is Margarita. And right. it begins follow me reader because we're on this odyssey. It's Joyce. it's really, I mean, this is really a Ulyssian uh, romp through Dublin, through Moscow, right? Yeah. A la Joyce, but with a you know with an allegorical, metaphysical um, paradigm rather than I what occurs that. in in, um, in Ulysses. And he says, "Whoever told you there's no such thing in the world as real, true, everlasting love? May the liar have his despicable tongue cut out. Follow me, my reader, and only me, and I'll show you what kind of love." No, the master wasn't mistaken that night in the hospital when just after midnight he told Ivan bitterly that she'd forgotten him. That could never be. Of course she of course she hadn't forgotten him. And then we get the descriptions of Margarita. Right. And now we're introduced to arguably the main character. And that's where the bus scene that we talked about. And so we can probably skip this one and Azazel's cream because we kind of covered that and we kind of left off right where she started hovering which is then she goes in on to flying. There is one part in this. Yeah, go ahead. Um, where it says on which, which um, chapter this is in, in the Margarita chapter. Okay. There's one part where Margarita had dreamed about an unfamiliar locale, a bleak and dismal place under an overcast early spring sky beneath the cover of, of patchy clouds, there was a flock of noiseless rooks. It's like in Macbeth, uh, darkness makes his way to the rookie wood. A rough bridge crossed a turbid, swollen stream, dismal, scrubby, half bare trees, a lone aspen, and beyond that, amidst trees and past a vegetable garden, was a log hut. 
It could have been an outside kitchen. The whole setting was so dead and dismal that it made you want to hang yourself on the Aspen by the bridge. Not a breath of wind, not a cloud moving, not a living soul, a hellish place for a living being, exclamation mark, which is very much like uh, Nordic literature, like where we have descriptions like this is in Beowulf um, in the descriptions of um, of uh, what's his name um, of the of the Grendel of Grendel in Beowulf. This is like a this is written almost like a, a, a Nordic epic poem where we have descriptions of the dismal places and the hellish places followed by an exclamation mark, you know, with a direct a sort of address to the reader and a summation. And the dream can we have an interpretation of the dream. The dream can only mean two things. If he's dead and was beckoning to me, that means he's come for me and I shall die soon. That's very good because my suffering will then end, Marguerite says. If he's alive, then the dream can only mean that he's reminding me of his existence and he wants to tell me that we'll see each other again. Yes, we'll see each other very soon. And then in the next scene, on the next page, she's standing against a triple mirror because, again, the mirror and, and, and a symbol of the psyche and she's going into it, she's talking about dreams. And also it's like, it's like with Hella, I think Hella is like a Hecate figure in this, which is the, you know, the, the triple goddess. And of course she is a witch, right? Margaret is a witch. Um, yes. So yeah, we can skip, we can skip ahead. Like you said, um, to the flight. The I ointment. think that's 21 is called flight. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Invisible and free. Yeah. And so this generally, the gist of ch chapter one is she is on her broomstick, which just sort of appears <laughs> when she starts floating in the air yeah. and she starts flying around Moscow and is loving it and uh, goes up. It kind of describes her going to different altitudes, looking over mm -hmm. the city. And eventually she go, goes by uh, the apartment complex, by the Grory Dev, the place where the Basilit meet. And sees uh, it's like uh, Lukunchu or Lukincho or let me uh -huh. see. If I, he's the guy that was the biggest critic of the master and about his manuscript and told him to never write anything again. Uh, um, let me see if I can find it. Um, no, I don't see it, but it, he's only mentioned as a major critic to the master, and so she. Uh -huh goes by and sees his apartment and then goes in and begins to wreck it, uh, destroys his piano, uh, which is kind of symbolic of the destruction of empty art. So it's an expensive mm -hmm. artifact. It's a musical instrument. But again, the criticism of this gentleman, this Russian writer is that he's like the number one propagandist. He's like the biggest sellout. He does everything that the Soviet Union wants him to do. And so she's destroying valuable self-expressions that aren't really used properly. And then she floods his apartment, breaks all the windows and flies by a little kid who's terrified by all the noise she's making. Right. She reassures him that it's just young boys throwing rocks and he'll be all right. And then she just <laughs> takes off and she, um, uh, she's eventually met by Azazello who tells her to head South towards the river. And uh -huh. so and then she makes her way and we start going on her jer this journey with her. But um, it, anything specific in regards to this kind of the, the major point of this chapter is her destroying this guy's apartment and sort of getting revenge on behalf of the master. Mm -hmm. No, I think um, where she starts to go to meet Satan is where it gets particularly you know, when you're reading the book, the momentum really starts to build here because she's starting to go into the into the satanic ball. Yeah. And we get real Miltonian images. Um, and she's like you said, she's flying. Yeah. Now it's by uh, candlelight. Uh -huh, next chapter, yeah. And she's making her way um, to this general relocation. She said to go, but she eventually gets to the river. And there's a fat man swimming in the river, we're told, and he refers to her as queen. Um, yeah. So people are beginning to recognize that she has been chosen by Wolin for this particular ball that evening, and they're treating her like royalty. And 
she eventually crosses over to this big house across and, and party. There's like a party going on huh. across the other side of the river. And it's all these people that are waiting for her and are going to basically doll her up for the ball. Yeah, she, um, she, the first thing that struck her was total darkness in which she found herself. Uh, then she gets to this house. There's an endless staircase. The light moved up and Margarita could see the illuminated face of the tall black man who was holding the lamp in his hand, which is very Masonic. Yeah. Right. She's walking into this uh, ritual initiation where she's going to get dolled up. Like, um, and, and then we have the talk of the fifth dimension. Um, the simplest uh, thing of all. And I was wondering if you could uh, illuminate this for us. Uh, it says anyone familiar with the fifth, fifth dimension has no trouble whatsoever expanding his residence to whatever size he wishes. So it's like, uh, what do you call that endless staircase? Who's the, who's the artist that does the endless staircase um, in, la in labyrinth? Um, someone in the chat will know. Um, what's uh, uh, MC Escher. That's it. Okay. MC Escher. So it's like, things aren't what they appear. We're walking into sort of like a weird tesseract where it's much, it's like infinitely big on the inside as opposed to the outside. Well, and, um, I, and I kept thinking regarding this fifth dimension thing, the way I took it throughout the book, cause it gets brought up when they get into um, the, the ball itself. And he expands the apartment to be an entire ballroom is like orthodoxy teaches that demonic attacks and the battlefield is your imagination and that the imagination is like the noetic realm. And that's where these angels and demons exist and they don't mm -hmm. have this physical, but we have access to both. And so the create, the courageous artist is the only one that's actually utilizing the imagination, actually mm -hmm. going into the fifth dimension. So I, I thought of it like in Dante's Inferno where he, the fifth, it's like the it's like in that movie um uh event horizon if you've if anybody's ever seen that in event horizon yes they're on a spaceship and they open up a, a time portal and they're going to go through the black hole or in disney's black hole which is a horrifying movie when you go through the black hole into the fifth dimension you're in hell right and and the and the the city of dis in dante's inferno is kind of like this it's it's like there's a procession of people inside they'll never leave there's a guy bathing in like the river sticks. He's in Stygian blackness. They're crossing the abyss again over into the other side. And she's going to be the queen of hell here uh, made up in this ritual. And it says in the book about the fifth dimension um, that uh, I might add esteemed lady to the devil knows what size <laughs> I've known people who weren't the faintest who haven't the faintest conception of the fifth dimension or of anything else for that matter, but who have still worked wonders when it came to expanding their residence. Take, for example, the city dweller I heard about who got a three room apartment in the embankment and turned it into four rooms in a flash without recourse to the fifth dimension or to the, anything else that goes beyond human reason. It's also an inversion of in my father's house. There are many mansions. Yes. Right. So, so here we're in hell. Uh, with this, you know, this uh, satanic throne and this endless procession of the sinful um, covering all the manners of sin. Right. Um, from the from the largest to the smallest, they make use of that. The worst is um, is uh, that it's a it's a cowardice. Right is is cowardice. And you've mentioned that so many times throughout the analysis that the the the, the sin of cowardice. Right. It's the opposite of the Inferno because the in the Inferno disloyalty is where Satan lives in the ninth. The ninth circle is for the disloyal. It, you know, so loyalty, Judas, loyalty comes up with Matthew Levi to Christ <clears throat> um, and Margarita to the master. Th those are kind of the but it's not as significant mm -hmm. as the the courage cowardice thing. That's the theme that. Right runs through the whole book i'm sure bulgakov was aware of that and he's making use of, yeah. of something different you know because in in the inferno in the ninth circle it's the inverted world where satan is upside down in the ice right. it's so hot that it's cold and we have satan with pinwheels in his eyes with you know judas brutus and cassius um the arch the arch um traitors you know b forever burning in the in the face of satan right um and so then, yeah, the, the, there's the spring ball of the full moon, very witchy, 
Ball of the Hundred Kings. And it's essentially what's the title of your chapter th 23? It is um, mine's mine's the great ball at Satan's. Yeah, Satan's grand ball. OK. It will be a wondrous event full of Tom Cruise and all sorts of elites. Carl Schwab will be there. <laughs> <laughs> and this is pretty trippy because it's yes. very um, Harry Potter. Right uh -huh. here where she goes out in a flying car, like a flying, you know, you think of some like old Rolls Royce or something comes in and like, and, then, and she like yeah. gets into it. And they like fly <laughs> off. <laughs> it's John Dillinger. All the stars are here. Right. <laughs> it's, it's the red carpet at the Met Ball. Um, it's also Queen Mab. It's the Queen Mab speech that Mercutio gives in um, Romeo and Juliet, where Queen Mab is on a. Well, in that plays Romeo and Juliet is a, I think an archetype for the master and Margarita. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause they yeah. have to um, die to be together. That's right. Two characters, uh, uh, united in death, but with a happy ending, um, in the end, which is the strange thing about Romeo and Juliet. Cause it's a, it's not a classical, um, <laughs> tragedy. You know, they're going to die at the beginning. They tell you that in the opening, um, in the opening sonnet, but in this, we don't, we don't even get to Margarita until the second part. Right. And the master is a, is an unseen hero in this, um, yes. or an unseen protagonist for much of it, which is, and it's the same with Christ, you know, again, in the book that, you know, the most of the book is about Satan and about all of these events, but Christ is, uh, dominating over them because of what happens in the end, right. That they right. are always subject to, to, to Christ's, uh, reign. And, yeah, like you said, she's being washed with blood, which occurred. Yes. Uh, yeah. So they you know, the cream is replaced by the by by literal blood. It's a baptism of blood, Elizabeth Bathory style. So the the flying car brings them to Burley uh his uh, apartment or for his former apartment, the one that his uncle wanted. Of course, that's where Wollen and his gang are staying. And so she gets brought in, and we're immediately told as a uh, reader that it's transformed into a massive ballroom of ordinateness. And um, this is where I believe Wolin brings up his ability to not just alter space and time, but also the fifth dimension. Right. And so, so it's, it's the Getty mansion in London, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, they like, uh, you know, uh, behemoth is like playing chess on a board. That's, He's right. apparently mo playing against nobody, but the pieces are moving. So it's um, the it's the grand chessboard, right? It's the it, game of nations. And uh, Wolin has a globe that is a what we're told is like a a live action replication of violence on the planet, and so he can see when wars break out and mm -hmm. when um, evils taking over, so he can see where he wants to go in the world. And. Uh, they begin like rubbing Wolin's bad knee. So we get brought into the privilege of knowing about his, this bad knee he has, which again, uh, I think we hit on, on, on both there, the inability to kneel and also Satan's fall from grace. And sometimes in art, sometimes in Renaissance art, you'll see wounded knees on it. Uh -huh. So, um, that goes from rubbing stuff on his knee to, rubbing blood and rose oil all over margarita's body right so now she's naked they're getting her ready and they're rubbing blood and rose oil over her <laughs> so this is uh feminine witch like an inversion of uh christ's sacrifice and the blood of i mean this is like adreno territory this is like washing in the blood of innocence to live forever um, and, and a weird thing here yeah, and is it does say it gives her vitality, right? Mm -hmm. So every time they, they rub the blood, they do it at, right. at another point too, after the ball, uh, it gives yeah. her vitality. So it's vam vampirical, the psychic, yeah. you know, energy and, and love of, of, uh, human creation. And then also it's weird how Satan is portrayed as non lustful when he's presented with with yeah, margarita and like in it himself, yeah there's yeah. the bed they're like here's your here's your hellish bed of fire for you all to make love and make a demon baby and he's like mm, here it is right? yeah, he, <laughs> yeah. he shows no sexual advances towards mm -hmm. her even though we're told that she's naked yes um 
Margarita found herself in a monstrously large pool surrounded by a colonnade. So it's almost Grecian. Uh, a gigantic black Neptune spewed a broad pink stream from his maw. The intoxicating smell of champagne came wafting up from the pool, which is, is a subversion of how you think you think of when you think of this setting, any other writer, I think writing this novel, it would say like it smelled of fire and brimstone and sulfur, but it, but he doesn't say that it smells of perfume, right? It smells of a kind of a, a there's like a lusty um, ambiance to this, to this scene uh, because of the sex magic that's about to occur. And um, the crystal bottom of the pool was lit from below and the light pierced through the vinous depths, illuminating the silvery swimming bodies. And they jumped out of the pool completely drunk. So we have this total orgy going on. And this this reminds me of a couple of things. One is like there's almost a Kublai Khan image in here of like we would circle around him thrice caves made of ice and also of what. Um, in one of the, I think it's in Tacitus because they mentioned Tacitus. Or he mentions Tacitus earlier in the book, and in Tacitus, when he's discussing um, Tiberius, Tib Tiberius had this grotto of what he called his minnows, where he would feed certain ages of people, you know, drugs and drink, and they would nip at his disgusting body in the pool. Uh, and and it's the sort of same thing here, like they're, they're human. It's just beastly, right? Yep. And uh, Wolin makes a point to Margarita to not drink alcohol. He tells her to only drink water for the night. And I took that as the devil, when you make deals, wants you to actually be totally self-aware and conscious uh -huh. of it. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to get this record contract, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can do all the methamphetamine I don't you want hear later. About all your casting couch experiences. <laughs> oh boy! Oh snap, y'all! Send in your super chats here because I just got snapped. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm like that bartender. I'm gonna whop that old devil, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell him to crawfish and whop that old devil. Um. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so one at one point margarita like falls down she like passes out and then they claim that hella um again the the half dead or undead woman gives her a blood bath so takes uh -huh. her to a blood shower she takes mm -hmm. a blood shower and revives come she becomes revitalized again and um so she meets Marinka Abramovich, right? <laughs> yeah, at the Killary Crimeton um, campaign well, party, and she stands on top of a staircase and meets everybody. Refers to her as the queen of the ball, uh -huh. and uh, come and like want to greet her and kiss her hand and stuff like this. Um, yeah. And it's like a who's who of people in history. Yes, I, I love the part with Caligula. <laughs> Neither Caligula nor Messalina aroused. Margarita's in interest now, nor did, nor did any of the other assorted kings, dukes, cavaliers, um, ca uh, suicides, poisoners, gallows birds, and and procuruses. Oh, there's G Max, Gieselin Maxwell, um, jailers, card sharps, executioners, informers, traitors, madmen, detectives, corruptors of youth. All those hellish creeps are there, kissing her hand. And she, yeah, she gets overwhelmed uh, with this, with the sensory details. And then they introduce Abaddon, right? Yeah. Um, the Abaddon, this demon of the abyss. And at the end, she walks through a half open door and Margarita walked through this half open door. It's like the ninth gate here or, or a Masonic ritual walking through the door. I just Let the mother the receive gate. the light. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was a pretty good movie. Yeah. It's Johnny intense. Depp. Yeah. Boris Balkan. Right? <laughs> you must find it, Mr. Cor Mr. Corso. You must find this book. Need m must I inform you of the danger of not finding this book? Yeah, Boris Balkan. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great movie, dude. One of the cornerstones of 1999 uh, Illuminate confirmed film, that and Eyes Wide Shut. That's a good one. And so uh, um, anything you want to say specifically of 23? No, nah, um, the master returns. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a ceremonial tribute to evil in the world. So that's why mm -hmm. it's a who's who. And um, remember, Bokakov, he couldn't have written in Stalin as one of the attendees. 
but right. he's certainly trying to make a potential uh connection there with the soviet yeah. union yeah he would have had himself removed from the photograph anyway so <laughs> um yeah chapter chapter 24 uh yeah chapter 24 is where the the master returns um i'm not capable oh of being and we did we did mention that at the party too um Azazello shoots two people. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so there's actually a uh, yes. there's actually a killing there, and then uh, we get to a blood ritual with Berlioz's head in the next chapter. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, which has made appearances uh, at least through illusion so far in this, and then yeah, and, and it's kind of it functions as kind of a you know, John the Baptist's head on the platter, right? Except it's Berlioz. To me, the party in Berlioz's head, it's very psychedelic in its attempt to break down time because, remember, the ceremony is a celebration of evil in the world. Berlioz's evil is his denial of both good and evil even existing, and therefore his naivety um, led to his own destruction. Mm -hmm. But they perform this blood ritual drinking out of his head right again tied to this critique on rationality um but it's psychedelic in the sense that Berlioz's head and it being cut off was a first domino effect and so you see how Bulgakov just keeps building and building and building and building and keeps like re-referencing things already happening yeah. so something mm -hmm. that happened in uh chapter three is the central point of a satanic ball in chapter 24. Right. Yeah. A web, a web, a web of words and meaning. Um, and, and we're eventually in chapter five, we're going to return again back to the past, which is the present um, with the procurator trying to save Judas. Um, but is there anything you want to say about chapter 24 here? Um so is the master uh, returns Wolin is as we know satan um yeah. and she basically drinks the the blood from Berlioz's head and oh, which is also kali i forgot to mention that's in yeah. remember in indiana jones in the temple of doom but unlike kali it's the... to be a submissive wife mm, yeah <laughs> <laughs> like she just wants to serve the master drink this head blood <laughs> But Terrible. so this is where they get reunited in this weird, mystical, magical ritual. So she uh -huh. drinks the blood and all of a sudden there, she kind of goes into the back bedroom where she initially began her entrance into this apartment. And Woland is there and time starts warping and then the master is brought there. And he's kind of again, he thinks he's crazy. So he's been in a psych ward. And he hasn't written anything and he thinks Margarita's forgotten him. Now he's in this ballroom bedroom. Um, and he sees Margarita. She looks like she's 20. She's all dressed up from this ball, and she begins giving him some type of wine uh that brings him back to life. And he goes from denying that he's really seeing her to realizing what's happened, to realizing. Uh, that she sort of made a deal with the devil, but they're back together. So, so he, he, when he comes back to reality, it, this is like, this mirrors his artistic process. It's like, he's coming to back. He's realizing his deeds, realizing his art. And he's coming back to a place where he's come out of the sort of vacuum of having done all this stuff. And, or, or no, that's the, no, you're talking about uh, Berlioz. Um, but we have a, a coming back to life, which is a, a kind of inverted resurrection theme in the novel or the book within the book. And we also have the fact that when you when you sign the contract and the deal with the devil, you're going all the way. Yeah. Right. She goes. I mean, she <laughs> it's not just that you're going to, you know, like perish in the in the hellish fires of pandemonium right you're going to go all the way through a sex magic ritual in front of the entire population of hell and have to get you know have to get uh freaked on by satan 
but that, <laughs> but, but, but then the master reappears. Yeah. The master reappears. Um, and, um, let's see the, and then we learn why Margarita calls him the master. Um, and I would say this is where all three themes, because the pilot Christ theme is coming through the master. Mm -hmm. The love is coming through Margarita. And mm -hmm. then uh, Woland, uh, representative of the Moscow visit. And so we mm -hmm. finally have all three narratives together in this chapter. Right. Um, but and Wolin was impressed by Margarita because she didn't ask for anything um, after this ritual uh, for herself. And when presented with the opportunity to have a wish, she chose to forgive the woman who suffocated mm. the baby after she was raped because this woman, as uh, described in the book, the handkerchief followed her around everywhere to remind her for the fact that she killed her own child. And margarita forgives her as a some sort of wish so that she doesn't have to be followed around by her handkerchief woland as satan is impressed with this and then allows her to choose another which is the master so is the book overall not to skip ahead i'm just saying is the book overall partly showing you that regardless of your sins and your deeds when love is concerned um, cause she wished she wishes for love that absolution is Christ's to only to give and that mm. your soul isn't yours to give away because in the end, Christ gives them this place anyway, right? Regardless of Woland. I mean, they're, they're still, they, they are under, they're literally in, under in regards to that. I think it's the master, but somebody mentions, I'm pretty sure it's the master that everybody is subjected to the same eternal laws. Mm no matter what you believe. And so that would insinuate what you're saying in regards to maybe Christ being the only absolution. And he's the only one that gives peace in the whole book. Yes. And he's the only one that grants the opportunity for love in the whole book. So Woland functions as a sort of minister of weird minister of justice in the yes. book, but he's still under the, the judge, the great judge, the, the, the King of Kings. Right. Um, and that he has to pay fealty to him even with his burnt knee. Um, so that's how we end up with the resolution in the book, right. With, with them gaining peace, which is it, which is a, a kind of true justice here because they're, they, like it says, they haven't earned the light. They've earned this sort of peace. It's, it's weird because the book ends up with the two of them in a specific locale, right? Right. But they're dead. Uh, they're dead, but they end up together in death like Romeo and Julia and also yes. like Heathcliff and Kathy in um, Wuthering Heights. It's a very weird sort mm. of Wuthering Heights tale because Heathcliff um, sells. He doesn't literally sell his soul in the book, but he but he wishes for uh, to roam the earth as a ghost in this specific location and, you know, on the moors with um, Kathy. And they have a sort of a piece together, um, I suppose. Yo, we've been going uh, three hours and 15 minutes here. We, we're going to deep dive through this book. This and is we're a almost, deep dive. Yeah, we're almost at the end here. So please, um, if you want to yeah, super Send chat, in your super um, chats, people. Support BLA. Get your membership. Yeah. Send in questions. Yes, yes. And we'll get to those. Um, Caravaggio says, we're getting some Gnostic thing here with Stalin as the Demiurge. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. No, n not with Stalin not, as the Demiurge. Not uh, yeah. Uh, you could say that God the Father was a sort of Demiurge because of Matthew Levi cursing him for allowing the suffering of Jesus. But it, in their Aeronostic, uh, that's where it's very dualistic because it's very explicit that Bulgakov keeps stating that good can't exist without evil. And that's where I'd say it's not orthodox theology because we believe in a theology of the privation of evil doesn't have a positive ontology. So therefore it can't be like some countering balance to good. It's just the absence of, 
It's not the yin and yang people in the prison planet. They're not (laughs) co-equal. Hey, did you see uh, Elon Musk made a comment on X today that he may bring back Alex Jones? Well, you know, I didn't see that, but let's... It was big news because... Yeah, let's let's Tucker Carlson, like, probably right now... Yeah, they're um, doing the interview. He did a two-hour interview with Alex Jones, and uh, Tucker, I guess, advocated to Elon Musk to let him back on. Well, let's see. The proof is in the pudding, so let's see. Yeah, we'll see, right. yeah. We'll yeah. see. Anyways, that was a digression. I apologize. Um, that comment because of the comment that he made when he when he when he declared that he was off forever is what pissed me off so bad. Um, I couldn't stand it anymore. I got off there. So you know, hopefully, we'll see. So this is then the extraction of the master. We kind of rub that. Uh, ru- um, Ra- uh, oh, wrapped that one up chapter 25 let me pull up my and we were referring to Alex Jones Lord Voldemort is a is a guy and that's who we're referring to for the algorithm yes and <laughs> this chapter 25 takes us back to Pontius Pilate who is mm-hmm. distraught over his cowardice and he's trying to not let it bother him and mm. the only one close to him is his devout dog uh was it mm, Manga? yeah and yeah. uh um so th- th- that oh that's another point of loyalty banga right because that mm. that is another point where banga is actually the first one christ at the end there's this scene where wolin satan uh i think korviev and uh behemoth I think their penance was up or something, but uh, specifically Jesus, Banga, and Pontius Pilate are able to sort of sail off into the sunset. And the first one in is Banga. And I thought, again, that was representative of loyalty and courage. It's a counterpoint to Behemoth, too. Right, to the the big black familiar spirit cat that causes so much hijinks yeah a trick uh, throughout where the dog is loyal and that is rewarded it's also a counterpoint to cerberus right being the guardian of the underworld it's a it's also an allusion to uh the great dog argos um who is the first person that recognizes odysseus when he gets back home to ithaca the dog argos stayed at the gate waiting for his master to return for 20 years and when he recognizes him he you know smiles at him and then dies Mm -hmm. so loyalty absolutely and and that's where the loyalty is brought up with matthew levi too because even though bulgakov portrays the gospel of matthew as inaccurate now i don't know if he really believed that or not but that's what's portrayed in the book at least yeah he does portray matthew levi as having a pure heart for to follow jesus that's probably the voice of the speaker here and not Bulgakov himself is what I'm giving him. Right. Yeah. That's the, that's the, that's yeah, the exactly. I don't know what Bulgakov he, he may have, and he may be limited. Maybe he feels like he couldn't present a true theological account mm-hmm. because of their restriction on religion. I don't know. I, you know, I don't think anybody knows his actual religious beliefs. Maybe they're out there, but um, um yeah, go ahead. Where are we? Uh, this if, is where uh, Pilate basically decides he's going to kill Judas. Uh-huh. So Pilate, being distraught about his cowardice, is like trying to deal with it. Banga, his dog, is the only one that's around him, who never leaves him, and he, he becomes interested in Christ, and he feels like whatever Christ was doing is more important than his hierarchy even though he's going to use his power to sort of maintain its structure and he's going to lie to one of his assist- assistants, essentially he's saying he's going to tell him that, Oh, well, I know that somebody's going to go kill Judas. Well, really right. it's Pilate who's going to go kill him in an attempt to revenge his cowardice on Jesus. But you see, again, it's the ambiguity of good and evil here because we see Pilate was a coward, but now he's going to be portrayed as trying to do the right thing by killing Judas, who portrayed Jesus. And in the book gets 30 (laughs) pieces of, you know, whatever. So, I mean, he doesn't say silver. It's like tetra tetra drachmas. Yeah. 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 And um, 
he, he's going well, to throw the money back over to the uh, to the Jews, signifying that he knows that the Jews pay Judas. But it's like it calls into question, like, do, are you really doing the right thing by killing Judas? Because it's not Judas hanging himself, which is according to biblical tradition. Maybe that's the best he can do in his Roman paradigm. You know, he wasn't there for all the um, teachings of Christ, but he says he would do anything to save the totally innocent mad dreamer and physician from death. Later on, Banga began howling at the moon and the light blue road, slippery and oily smooth, vanished in front of the procurator. But it's like he is Roman after all. He's a, maybe we need to go and whack this guy. <laughs> I think I've done something pretty bad here. Maybe we need to go and make up for it by whacking this guy. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to give this this traitor any money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um yeah, here's the this is uh, the chapter of the burial. Um, here's the bag of money the murderers threw at the high priest's house. The blood on it is the blood of Judas. And before that, therein lay the charm of this. And this journey. is the only two Fairway chapters that that are consecutive that stay in uh, Jerusalem. Um, and then we get um, Matthew um, taking uh, Christ's uh, body with him to the cave. Yeah, right, to the tomb. And, um, and and we're told this hooded man, and he goes to this woman named Niza. This is and Joseph she, of Arimathea. Is that who this is? <laughs> well, it, it, it almost insinuates that Pilate's got a thing going on with this married woman, Niza, who's apparently a beautiful young woman who's married, and he's he goes and gets her to lure Judas out of the city. I don't have to, I don't have any time for her to get on her knees tonight. I gotta go and whack this guy. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, um, isn't, that, isn't that how you read it? I mean, he doesn't yeah. explicitly say they have a romantic relationship, but it sure kind of seems. I mean, it seems like that, especially once yeah. you find out that it's it's uh, Pilate who's the hooded man who goes and stabs Judas in the back, which is ironic, right? Because he kills him by stabbing him in the back all the way to his heart, right? It's also ironic because justice was done in front of everyone. And now this, this justice this is, done is done behind everybody's. Yeah. Everybody's back, including Judas. It's also very Roman, right? The stab in the back, you know, the, the Caesarian stab in the back. <laughs> All this. Um, <laughs> 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 um, what? Thank God. No gabagool in here. Um, uh, there's a beautiful phrase at the end of this because Christ is referred to as the water of life. It says um, water of life. There is no death. Yesterday, we, we ate sweet spring figs. Grimacing from the effort, Pilate squinted and read, we shall see the pure stream of the water of life. Mankind will gaze at the sun through transparent crystal, which is, is that in Revelation? Christ is the water of life? Yes. Uh, I know it's throughout, but, um, and then the, the chapter, chapter he, 21. Yeah, he also it to the Samaritan woman directly. Uh, chapter 21 ends with, um, I too know there will be more blood. Your words don't surprise me. Uh, the room, and then the, at the end, the moon was oh, rapidly yeah, this fading. This is when Matthew goes in front of Pilate. Yeah. Uh, the moon was rapidly fading, and at the other edge of the sky, the whitish speck of the morning star appeared. Christ is the morning star. Um, and then I guess we go on to the end of the apartment, chapter uh, number 50, chapter 22. I don't know. Do you want to say anything about this chapter? Testimonial. Uh, I'm on chapter 26. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, chap no, you're right. Chapter 26. Uh hold on. Hold on. What was I looking at? I don't know my Roman numerals. I just yeah, sorry. That was chapter that was the end of chapter. I meant yeah, chapter 26. I was gonna say that yeah. So <laughs> yeah. when Matthew's in front of Pilate at the end of 26, uh um, one of the interesting things again, he refuses to sit on a chair, symbolizing also Christ, who is polite, although Matthew's not polite. Christ right. was incredibly polite to Pilate, though he didn't recognize the authority as people typically would in Roman society. Right. Matthew also doesn't recognize his authority, but he's irate. And he says he wants to go kill Judas. And mm -hmm. Pilate tells him, it's, you can't. And he says, well, what's going to stop me? He's like, well, he's already dead. Mm, it's done. <laughs> uh, we took care of that thing in that place with that guy. Right. And, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the climax there of chapter 26 and how that ends. Right. So chapter 27, that's a V-I-I. -I. There's a V, I realize. 
everybody. And we uh, we move back now to the end of the apartment, number 50, which is where uh, Berlioz's, his uh, apartment is, where the whole thing's taking place, where mm-hmm. uh, the, the ball took place, where he scared all these people. And so we see that Margarita has been rewarded for her courage with exactly the life that she longed for, which is to be with the master and basically take care of him and help him with his manuscript and and Mm -hmm. support it. And she, uh, even though, and it doesn't say how long they weren't together exactly. You're not really sure when exactly this point happened where she went home and, and he thought he went crazy and, you don't know was it a few years because it feels like it's like a few years went by or something right but she maintained all his money so he went to a psych ward and i, I gave i forget how much it was like two hundred forty thousand rubles or something like that it's like three dollars um, <laughs> yeah um and she didn't spend any of it she kept all the official paperwork she kept a burnt version of his manuscript when he tried to burn it and I forget, like a, the, I think a petal of the flower that when they first met or something like yes. that. No, I think it was a rose. Was it the rose? Was it ro- yeah, I think it was a rose petal. Yeah, yeah, so it wouldn't have been that. But anyway, she had like some memorabilia, but she had kept that. And so this is where like he gets a restored version of his manuscript. Uh-huh. And all these magical things are happening. And yeah, they're basically reunited due to this magic ritual. And... <laughs> We move from that apartment to um, back to Rimsky. Uh, uh-huh. He's hiding in a hotel room in Leningrad. As we said, he got scared from the vampires. Yeah. Um, Stoipa <laughs> has able. There's been- so much in this book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so Stoipa has been able to track down a flight from Yalta, mm. and he's come back yeah. to Moscow. Um, no one can find Veronuka, the guy that turned into a vampire. Um, Professor Stravinsky at the clinic is figuring out what's wrong with uh, Nikonor Ivanovich Bolsoy, who um, he was the he was the guy that had the fake money that mm-hmm. he was hiding in the vent, and everybody thinks he's crazy. Although he's trying to tell him that he interacted with uh, Satan, and then you had George. Uh, Bengalski, the MC, right, who lost his head during the magic ritual. He's now in the psych ward. And you have Ivan, homeless, the poet that was sitting yeah. on the bench at Patriarch Pond. And so they're all basically talking to each other. There's a whole scene where they're back in the psych ward talking to each other. Um, what do you think about what do you, because this is one of the major themes? Um, one of the last, I think, the last major theme in this, which is obviously insanity in the psych ward. And, you know, it's, it's, this is, I mean, this again is one of the relevant things in the book, how mental illness and demonic energy sort of intertwine um, within the book. And it functions as like a playground for demons or, or where people go when they're unable to, when they try to speak the truth, um, but are, it's un, you know, it's unbelieved. So what do you, what's your take on that in the book? Just that the truth sounds insane in, an insane world, even mm-hmm. though the insane world is the most rational world. Yeah. It's also, I think there's a, there's, it's also showing like the fine line between the genius and the insane, right? That, yeah. that the, the people in the insane asylum certainly deal with a, an exaggerated version of reality um, or they're right on the edge. The same thing happens in Amadeus. And with, they um, all, the people in the psych ward, uh, except the master, I don't remember him being sedated, but everybody else, basically struggles with the acceptance of being sedated and just accepting yeah. uh, that they're crazy versus actually wanting to fight against the evil and stop it. Right. They're kind of in a, like a hell of their own mind. Uh, yeah. Within this thing. And it, it because they like- lack, all of them lack the full courage to actually fight it. Right. And that's why they all that's why you had a whole chapter earlier in part one devoted towards uh, the split of Ivan, because we'll find out at the end that he basically is a uh, professor of literature and he or a history. I think he, he moved from poetry to history, but he lives with his wife. And once every year he goes and sits on the same bench at Patriarch Pond 
uh, under that moon and has a dream where he relives this whole thing. But then he wakes up and he doesn't do anything about it and it happens every year. And so it shows that even though it happened and he does believe it happened, he eventually just believes the official narrative struggles with it, but just goes back to living in Soviet society. What if Patriarch Pond is the scene in Home Alone 2 and he's the bird lady? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> She's seen some things. Um, should we barrel through here, chapter 29 through the end? Uh, yeah. It, 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 it wraps up pretty quickly, book. yeah. It, it basically finishes with um, a, a lot of stuff, but basically it wraps up with Master and Margarita go back to the old apartment he had magical things happen official paperwork comes about um the woman underneath berlovsky or berlioz's apartment where this whole everything's kind of taken place she finds a, a bedazzled horseshoe that wolen mm -hmm. satan gives to margarita which yeah. you you i mean a horseshoe is usually a symbol of like good luck which yeah. is again strange why would satan give a symbol like that um she drops it that woman finds it uh and behemoth or i i think it no it's as uh Korviev, he gives her money as the case always happens and that money turns into counterfeit money her money turns into u.s dollars so it's funny mm. he actually refers to dollars um but um burley uh behemoth and, and korliev get chased and shot at at one point well that was right. the end of, of, uh, yeah. of the chapter we were just on which is that um chapter 27 yeah at the uh -huh. end of chapter 27 behemoth and cordor uh Korviev, yeah they just start uh opening fire and uh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it demonstrates their supernatural ability because uh like the police never nobody was able to hit right. them um there's a great part a description at the beginning of 29 uh, where Woland is seated on the folding tabaret, his long broadsword has been rammed vertically into the crack between two flag flagstones, thus forming a sundial. The sword's shadow lengthened slowly and steadily as it crept up to the black slippers on Satan's feet with his sharp chin resting on his fist and one leg folded beneath him. Woland sat hunched on the tabaret, uh, staring fixedly at the vast assortment of huge buildings, palaces, and shacks condemned to destruction. This is Miltonian. This is yeah. this is Satan sitting uh, on the edge of the precipice uh, in adamant, adamantine chains, gazing at the destruction and hell yes. um, with, yeah. with his broadsword in the chasm. And then we also have Matthew who says, I'm not a slave becoming enraged. I am his disciple, he says, uh, because Wolin says you're his slave. Um, and then he's read the master's work and asked, and here we get the, here we get the final judgment within the book, which is Matthew comes and says, he has read the master's work. He's talking about Christ and has asked that you take the master with you and grant him peace. Is that so difficult for you to do spirit of evil capitalized? And then Wolin says in his pride, nothing is difficult for me to do. As you well know, he was silent for a moment and added, but why aren't you taking him with you to the light? He has not earned light. He has earned peace, said Levi in a sad voice to him that that it shall be done and leave me this instant. So they have to they have to do this. And then we go into chapter 30. Time to go. Time to go. And then they they gather them together. Master and Margarita, they say their goodbyes to a bunch of people. And I'm skipping, kind of skipping over yeah. here a lot, but they, they uh, say their goodbyes. Azazel uh, confronts the cook who, this is the part where he tries to make the sign of the cross. And Azazel says, I'll cut your hand off. And then they end up flying. They fly over darkness. Um, oh, yeah. And, and, the, and the shootout was at the Mazalit meeting. Mm. So it was in the fine dining room. Right. And the, the, the to put uh, a point that I think of his interest within everything you said is once Matthew relays to Wolin Satan that Jesus has said Master Margarita or basically or at least the master specifically is going to receive peace. The two sort of henchmen go back to the apartment where they're at and have them drink wine, which kills them. 
But then they come back alive, they drink it again, and then they become out of their body. Yeah, and doesn't Margarita say something like, oh, I get it, we're dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not yet. Shouts so, out to KF in the chat. She says Koroviev is from Korova, which is cow, another animal reference. Oh, is that like Korova milk bar? The, makes, it makes sense. Oh, yeah, Anthony Burgess, we did. Great um, call, KF. Great yeah, call. great one. We did. I did not know that, and that's from the Satnat. Um, uh, you know, s n n sort of news speak in Clockwork Orange. The Corova Milk Bar makes sense. That's where they're drinking Drencrum, which is which is Drino. Yeah. And one person that we never mentioned is Natasha, the housekeeper. Mm -hmm. Is that she get actually in one of the chapters, and it's kind of a minor thing, so it wasn't a huge part of the general narrative. But she takes the same cream and puts it all over her that uh Margarita oh, yeah. did. She becomes a witch and she yeah. loves it. And so yeah. she actually goes to the party and asks Bolin Satan to continue to be a witch. She took the neighbor, the person who lived under um margarita uh nikolai ivanovich and turned him into a pig who the reason why she did is he came to give her he saw how beautiful she was after she put the cream on through the window and he went up to the apartment apparently went inside found her in the bedroom and propositioned her for sex she put the cream on him he turned into a pig she was a witch and she wrote rode him uh, through yeah. that, she didn't have a broom. She rode the pig, and so after the ball, she continues to be a witch. I, uh, Nikolai Ivanovich, chooses to go back to being a man, and he, again, symbolic of, in a, in a way, cowardice, is just another cog in the wheel of the Soviet machine, and he goes to live that life. And so, yeah, I just wanted to highlight. She Natasha, sounds like an she animal house. She's like an animal house. You, sir, are a P.I.G. pig, right? <laughs> Turns him into a pig. And then, of course, if pigs could fly, right? Because this deals with the insanity thing. Like, oh, that'll never happen unless you know, pigs can fly. And so we have flying swine in the sky. Also, there's the flying. This reminds me of the flying pig imagery in um, in the Pink Floyd with the Pink Floyd album. Uh, but it's the unbelievable becomes, uh, you know, the metaphysical blends into uh, reality here. And yeah, and so it, it ends then with Master tells Ivan at one point he goes back to the psych ward when they're like going back to their apartment and tells him to finish the manuscript, which Ivan has he clearly doesn't do and didn't have an intention to. But the master completes his own manuscript at the end by freeing Pilot from the guilt of what he did. And so it ends by Pilot in Benga, still by his side, um, in a way mourning over the grief of what he's done in the moonlight, which the moonlight plays a repetitious role in the book. And whenever it brings up Pilot, he's usually, at least after the chapter two, he's usually under the moonlight. So it shows that he's sort of scarred. He's under the same moon, pondering the same things. And it's the master. And I think what it's really highlighting is a sort of magical relationship between good art and reality. Mm -hmm. And that it, it actually is in a way a sort of magic that it, you know, you can bring things to life and cause real effects. And for him, he frees and forgives uh, Pilot, a la Margarita, forgiving the woman that got graped and had the baby that she killed. And this sort of, ends the book that's like chapter 32 so realizing grief unburdens oneself for the future and for and in terms of their what ends up being their absolution and eternal refuge just like the master is unburdening himself of this story he has to tell and writes the book and it's kind of like you can't help but think of like writing your name in the book you know finding your name in the book of life mm -hmm. um where as Margarita has written her name in the book of death, but still receives grace here. Um, th this chapter, the last chapter, chapter th yeah, 32 is, is interesting because I think it's one of the best chapters because we're at the culminating book, uh, part of the book. And because again, all this entire web is brought uh, to fruition with this language here. Um, when the crimson moon rose up to meet, 
for them from behind the edge of the forest, all illusions vanished and the magical mutable clothing fell into the swamp and drowned in the midst. Um, Gold rains clinking softly a dark violet night with an extremely somber face that never smiled. And then we have, you know, the descriptions of the, of the satanic revenue uh, retinue right. here. Um, night had also torn off behemoth's fluffy tail, stripped him of this fur and scattered clumps of it over the swamps. The one who had been the cat, who amused the Prince of Darkness turned out to be a lean youth, a demon page. You mentioned this at the very beginning. The best jester the world had ever known. Azazello's eyes were alike empty and black, and his face was cold and white. Azazello was now flying in his true aspect as the demon of the waterless desert, the demon killer. And uh, Master's uh, hair has turned completely white in the shock, right? Um, and like the demon youth, the Master flew with his eyes fixed on the moon. Moon imagery again, lunar imagery. But he was smiling at, at it as if it were someone he knew and loved and he was mumbling to himself and then wolan was flying in his true aspect uh they might have been moonbeam chains the horse's reins and his horse just a clump of darkness and the horse's mane a cloud and the rider spurs the white specks of stars and the moon flooded the area and then that you have your novel and uh, uh before them we have the description of where they're headed to which is amazing. The only thing that remained was the summit with the stone chair above the black, the black abyss where the walls had vanished, blazed a vast city dominated by glittering idols that towered over a garden gone look gone luxuriantly to seed during these thousands of moons. And then we have um, the man in the white cloak with the blood red lining, which is Pontius Pilate got him from his chair, shouted, shouted something in a hoarse, broken voice. And then Wolin says, he says, are we going to go back? Are we going to go back into the story? Are we going to go back in time? Are we going to go back into our deeds? He says, why pursue that which is already finished? And then they they drop them off. Woland, forsaking all roads, plunged into the gap, which is the chasm in the earth, you know, from whence he fell or, or to which he falls. And then finally, at the end, that hero who was absolved on Sunday morning had departed into the abyss. Never to return, the son of an astrologer king, this is a, a pilot, the cruel fifth procurator of Judea, the knight Pontius Pilate. And we have a brief ep epilogue. Yeah. And the epilogue just basically says Moscow went back to being the way it was. Um, that the secret police were killing cats, all black cats in the city. Um, people were disappearing and um demonstrating that the links to which the Soviet Union would go to cover something up and how far away they were from the actual right. truth. Right. So, so that is The Master and Margarita by Bulgakov. Now, where else are you going to find a four-hour analysis of this book so in-depth like we've just done, people? Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, that was Keep great. Page. Really appreciate that was, you. That was I do recommend people reading it. I mean, even though we just went over the whole thing, there's so there's so much going on that there's so many details that if you actually read it, you would pick up be like, oh, I'll, you know, we didn't do we did pretty good, but it wasn't full justice to just read yeah. the book. But well, if you don't read the book, the, this is definitely the best. Yeah. Well, this is a, you know, graduate level master's degree course in just this book. You know, this would this could take an entire semester. You could do this for a career, but um, to fully get the the impact of the book, I think takes a huge, a huge amount of time, but in terms of, you know, the time that we have and what we've had to cover, I mean, this is, this is certainly a, a culmination of a bunch of books as prerequisites that I've done again, you know, um, uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, Herman Hesse, Poe, Dante, Milton, all, I mean, the work Faust, that you've done. Faust is a big yeah, one. Yep. Faust. Um, and there's one movie that, Again, it, it's so convoluted with the whole good and evil thing and the idea that where, you know, it kind of leaves you wondering, like, where exactly are the master and Margarita? Like, they made a contract with the devil. Are they are they dead? Are they on the planet? Because they're you're left yeah. with them at, in a place by the yeah. swamp or the, the little pond there. And. Pontius Pilate and Benga go off with Jesus, with Matthew. And um, I was thinking about the movie with Robin Williams where his wife commits suicide exactly. and he goes down yes. to, to hell to get her. What dreams may come. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. that movie kind of reminds me of the framework. Again, he, again, that movie isn't accurate to how 
at least the church would teach uh, the sort of metaphysical spiritual yeah. dynamics of the universe. But the narrative itself kind of reminds me of the master. The movie is accurate to this book, right? It contains Dante and elements and a lot of the imagery in the, in this is straight out of the inferno. Um, but where she ends up in that dark place with the, you know, the bare trees and, you know, yeah. a, a victim of what she did. And then where they end up is together is certainly like this book. Um, so that's a great, that's a great reference. Yeah. Okay. Should we do some super chats real quick? Yeah, do it. Um, let's see. Okay. Shouts out to, shouts out to Amy who drops 15 bucks via PayPal and says, been busy. I'm so glad to tune in again. Best lit analyzer. Thank you so much, Amy. Really appreciate you. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Uh, shouts out to Jason who drops 10 bucks via PayPal. Thank you so much, Jason. As always, thank you for being here for us and uh, holding things down. Really appreciate you as always. Uh, shouts out to real John Connor who drops 20 bucks for master and Margaritaville Borsch, <laughs> Borsch in Borsch in paradise. <laughs> Thank you, real John Connor. Margaritaville. <laughs> That's right. Cheeseburger in paradise. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you so thank you so much for that. Really appreciate you. Let's look at the uh super chats. If I can pull it up without freezing here. Um, yeah, super chats. Uh, thank you so much to Luchador who drops five bucks and says uh yeah do your rendition of the classic weird satanist guy video please thank we read that one thank you so much luchador um yo shouts out to juan carlos gonzalez jr who drops 199 and says good elvis stream uh last night thank you so much yeah everybody go back and watch my uh, elvis stream that i did with the great jamie hanshaw that was a lot of fun we did a deep dive into priscilla the sofia coppola movie and all things elvis please go back and check that out um, also shouts out to Sabrina who got in late, um, from that Elvis stream. She says, just showed up late. I will rewind. Thank you both. Uh, shouts out to Sabrina. Thank you so much. And then let's see, I think we got, um, there's a dono chat in here. Thank you to the members, people who grabbed a, a membership. Uh, really appreciate you. Shouts out to yo, shouts out to KF who drops 50 bucks. Um, here's for overcoming your cowardice and making it through all those russian names <laughs> Ooh, shots fired thanks, thanks so much guys and god bless yeah i don't know about cowardice i went as hard as i could with the russian names but thank you so much <laughs> you know i think we i think well we tried to do the names justice but yeah you, I, you, I butchered them you have been the uh you are the expert in uh in the russian language and, and we, <laughs> no. thank you for you. we thank you for your um we thank you, KF, for everything that you. Oh, did she's Russian. Oh, okay. She's well. She's yeah, and she's the one who dropped the comment. Yeah. Uh, um. Yes, cool. and then, yes, and then um, I think we got one more here, and I need to log on here because my phone just died. Um. And we had uh, one more. Hold on, one second here. Thanks everybody for sticking with us. Um. You're absolutely, that really, was a long one. No, and now it's, that's a lot of information if you haven't read the book it's hard to fit all that into context yes and uh yeah so that's she says thanks so much and god bless thank you uh kf really appreciate you and thank you for your karova comment in the chat that was you shouts out to uh first person q drops 399 dono chat great stream good prequel to master and commander okay that's well we just talked about master and commander um uh so everybody should watch that movie that's a great movie i did that on the uh ridley scott um uh bro i forget what i call it the ridley scott stream that we did um searching for the hero uh, as part of white squall i pose that as a counterpoint and shouts out to jesse for 10 bucks that's not much but next time it will be more merry christmas my friend hey thank you so much thank you for um merry christmas those, everybody those 10 hard-earned bucks because it's certainly hard to make a buck out there and uh we really appreciate you thanks for everybody in the chat you guys, please like and share the stream. Please go back and watch all of David Patrick Harry's entire <laughs> opus, all of his works. Um, and we recently did Home Alone. Yeah. And I uh, really appreciate you coming over here, uh, my friend. So thank you for that. And I hope to have you back here again soon. And um, anything else you want to end with? No, man. Thanks for having me. That was a lot of fun. Um, that's a, It's a lot in that book. I do recommend it if anybody ever wants to dive into it. Um, I really want to do uh, The Brothers Mer Karamazov by mm -hmm. Dostoevsky. I haven't read that one. That's a thick one. That's over oh, a thousand boy. pages, though. Yeah, yeah. That's an ordeal. So 
Um, my goal is eventually, uh, usually once I'm done with school, God willing, I want to do like a book club again and where you f get like a group of people and read five to 10 chapters and just meet, um, you know, in an orderly fashion. That's fun to go through with a group. I did the master margarita and we began with like 10 and I think we finished with three. So not everybody yeah. <laughs> likes to read. That's why I think it's popular to give overviews and, and talk about books, but well, um, Dostoyevsky is, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is tough. I did, um, the underground man with, um, Tristan primal edge health on his channel. And then it's not Dostoyevsky, but I did, uh, if anybody wants to go back and look at, um, Solzhenitsyn, I did one day in the life of Ivan, uh, Denisovich, Mm -hmm. uh, over a year ago um but yeah that'd be that's cool yes yeah so god willing i want to do that eventually in the future uh because it is fun to go with through a group because everybody sees different stuff and so when you mm. when you read it in more bite size and not do a whole book you know when you have like five chapters you can really have yeah. a great conversation for a couple hours with a group of people yeah and that's always fun but Appreciate you having me. Uh, God bless everything you do. Merry Christmas to you and your family and keep on rocking. Yeah. Merry Christmas to you, sir. And again, everybody that's master and margarita by Bulgakov. And uh, thanks everybody. We'll see you soon. Peace. Peace. God bless.